number five, Al Warden. American test pilot, engineer, and NASA astronaut Alfred Merrill Warden was the module pilot for the Apollo 15 lunar mission in 1971. One of the 24 people who have flown to the moon. Woohoo! He's got a couple of firsts though. He orbited it 74 times in the command module. He was the first to drive a moon car. After Apollo 15 reached lunar orbit and his crewmates departed and Warden spent three days alone in his module. That's terrifying. Traveling the furthest out from any other human. After he returned, the crew and him became involved in a NASA controversy, however. Not over leaked alien info, but over postage stamps they had taken to the moon. Yeah, big uh, no-no, apparently. They were reprimanded by NASA and did not fly in space again. Warden remained at NASA until 1975, then entered a private sector. And then it gets weird. On a British television morning show, Al Warden started talking about some interesting stuff. They asked him, why should we keep going back to the moon? He paused and replied, survival. Survival of our species. Warden also rejected the notion that humans could colonize planets within our solar system, calling them unsustainable. Then he claims he knows where to find habitable planets. When pressed on aliens, if he believes them or not, he said, yes. You know, I've been asked that question hundreds of times, yeah. We are the aliens though. We just think there's somebody else. But we were the ones who came from somewhere else because somebody else had to survive. They got in their little spaceship and they came here and they landed and they started civilization here. And if you don't believe me, go get books on the ancient Sumerians and see what they have to say about it. They'll tell you right up front, end quote. <laughs> okay, when you hear an astronaut say that, kind of jarring, kind of jarring. Number four, Roswell. As always, if you dig what we do here on Top 5 Scary, make sure you hit that like button. Birth of the UAP phenomenon, 1945, the US's first nuclear explosion. 1946, 1946, first underwater nuclear explosion. 1947, the first crash flying saucer. Coincidence? I think not. Especially since they've been known to hover around nuclear bases. Probably for the better. Humans are kind of the worst. Local rancher Mac Brazel finds the wreckage on his property in Lincoln County, New Mexico. Sheriff Wilcock shows RAAF's commanding officer, Colonel Blanchard, the materials. And during the night, the Air Force combs the entirety of the property, apparently harboring two small injured alien bodies. Taking them, of course, to Kirtland Air Force Base, New Mexico that night. And the very next morning, the Roswell Air Force makes a statement claiming they have recovered a crashed flying disc in local newspapers. Boom! History, baby! Photographs of Jesse Marcel, the head intelligence officer who investigated and recovered some of the debris. The very next day, the Army retracts their statement and all of a sudden, a high altitude weather balloon. Can you believe that, huh? <laughs> AKA the birth of a conspiracy theory. Nuclear fission explosions, weather balloons. Something's not adding up here. Number three, Edgar Mitchell. Edgar Dean Mitchell was a US Navy officer, aviator, test pilot, engineer, NASA astronaut, and of course, a ufologist. Ufology is the pseudo term for somebody who studies the UFO phenomenon. I don't think there's a degree you can get that in. If so, I'm signing up. What school? What school, sorry? He was the lunar module pilot of the Apollo 14 in 1971 and spent nine hours working on the lunar surface. He was the sixth person to walk on the moon. Yeah, he was walking while Warden was up there drifting in the currents of space. Mitchell publicly expressed his opinions and that he was sure that there were thousands of UFOs recorded since the early 1940s belonging to other planets. Thousands. Dateline NBC conducted an interview with Mitchell in 1996. He talked about meeting with officials from three different countries who claimed that they had met extraterrestrials in person. Quote, the evidence for alien contact was very strong and classified by governments who were covering up visitations and existence of alien bodies in places such as Roswell, New Mexico. Mitchell's book, The Way of the Explorer, discusses his journey. In 2004, he told the St. Petersburg Times that the US government was studying alien bodies and that this group had specifically stopped briefing US presidents since the 1960s. He said, quote, we all know that UFOs are real. Now, the question is, where do they come from? In 2008, Mitchell then was interviewed and claimed that Roswell crash was in fact the aliens that had contacted humans several times, but that the government had hidden the truth for more than 60 years. Scary stuff, scary stuff. He sadly passed in 2016. If we just reread the credentials alone, just one more time. Number two, James McDivitt. James Alton McDivitt is an American test pilot, Air Force pilot, engineer, and NASA astronaut who flew in both the Gemini and Apollo programs. After graduating first in his class with a Bachelor of Science degree in Aeronautical Engineering, 
He qualified as a test pilot at the Air Force. In 1962, McDivitt was selected by NASA for the Gemini 4 mission. In 1965, he saw, filmed, and photographed an object which approached the Gemini 4 as they were orbiting Earth. Over Hawaii, a craft of some sort. The UFO had a long arm sticking out of it. Here's what Major James McDivitt said. I was flying with Ed White. He was sleeping at the time, so I don't have anybody to verify this story. But we were drifting in space when suddenly an object appeared in the window. It's a cylindrical object, white. It had a long arm that stuck out of the side. The film was sent back to NASA and reviewed by some NASA film technicians. One of them selected what he thought was what they were talking about, at least before I had the chance to review it. And it was not the picture. It was a picture of a sun reflection on the window. So what were the pictures that he was talking about? In 1975, McDivitt said, I never made a big deal out of it. It was something I definitely couldn't identify. It looked like a beer can with a pencil sticking out of it. Yeah, I would eventually give up on that too if those were my credentials and people were like, yeah, right, James. When somebody has like 25 years of designing and flying space shuttles around, when they say, hey guys, I'm seeing something up here. It's not like, oh, James, huh, clean those old specs, would you? Yuck, yuck. Houston, we have a problem. And number one, Gordon Cooper. Leroy Gordon Cooper Jr., an American aerospace engineer, test pilot, US Air Force pilot, and the youngest of the seven original astronauts in Project Mercury, the first human space program in the United States. You know the pictures. It looks like they're wearing a tinfoil suit, you know? Old school, old school. After service as a fighter pilot in World War II, he qualified as a test pilot in 1956 and then was selected as an astronaut in 1959. In 1963, Cooper piloted the longest and last Mercury space flight, Mercury Atlas 9. 34 hours in space. The first American to spend an entire day in space, the first person to sleep in space, and the last American launched on a solo orbit mission. In Cooper's autobiography, Leap of Faith, co-authored by Bruce Henderson, he recounted his experiences with the Air Force and NASA and an alleged UFO conspiracy. Cooper claimed to have seen his first UFO while flying over Germany, then saw them land in a dry lake bed. Cooper claimed up until his death that the US was indeed covering up UFOs. He said that there were hundreds of reports made by his fellow pilots, many coming from the military pilots on radar. In his memoirs, Cooper wrote that he had seen unexplained aircrafts tons in his career, and that in 1978, he actually testified before the United Nations on the topic. He sadly passed in 2004. He was such a strong advocate for disclosure, and all of these astronauts are remembered as putting their neck and name out on the line for some truth. Number five, Leland Melvin. American engineer and now retired NASA astronaut Leland Melvin has spent hundreds of hours in space, literally hundreds. Leland holds four honorary doctorates for his service in education, the sciences, and philanthropy. Doctorates. I'm just saying that before the comments start rolling in saying he's just another wacko. He's crazy. They're, they're not wackos, people. Any of them. They've been screened so many times by so many people with so many tests. They have to be damn well near perfect before going up on or in NASA's budget. Before his career with NASA, Leland was actually all American for football. Detroit Lions, Toronto Argos. Guy made the NFL and then said, you know what? I think I'm gonna be an astronaut. Like, give this guy a Netflix movie, would ya? He was selected by NASA in 1998 after getting injured with a football career. Guy goes from the turf to working at NASA Langley Center. This guy's put in time, both down here and up there. Mission after mission with NASA. He's got quite the practice at the whole floating around thing. When Leland was pressed about otherworldly visitors and his ideas about the cosmos, he said this when he was working up in orbit. He had seen something translucent, curved and organic looking when he was working with fellow astronaut Randy Bresnik. The pair of them, again, pair of them, called down to NASA to ask what it could be. NASA's official response was, probably ice. Yeah, nice and specific there, Houston. Thank you for that. When has NASA ever said probably? Melvin dismissed this and figured it was NASA's explanation to just cover it up. Like, who's more qualified here? That's all I'm asking. When the most qualified people are like, yeah, I can't tell if that's frozen water or a full-on mothership, Houston. Either they shouldn't be up there at all, or we need some more Windex on those windows there, NASA. Huh? Number four, Ivan Wagner. As always, if you dig what we do here at Top 5 Scary, make sure you hit that like button or comment down below. It really helps the channel out. Have you ever seen a UFO out there? Yeah, you. You. Have you seen one? Comment down below with some details about your experiences. I know I have. 
twice now. Hence the obsession with all this stuff. Those Reddit rabbit holes, boy oh boy. Speaking of falling into a wormhole of conspiracy and who said what, astronaut Ivan Wagner, or I should say cosmonaut Ivan Wagner, since he's Russian by birth and although he's bunking up with some roomies up there in the ISS, he was on the ISS as a first timer just back in 2020. Does NASA initiate rookies up there? Like pull pranks on the newbies? Like no gravity, just to buckle you while you sleep, flow you out, you know? He and fellow Russian Anatoly Ivanishin were working up there alongside Chris Cassidy, the American commander of said expedition. When Wagner was orbiting the Earth, he might have captured some footage of UFOs, better known as UAPs, unidentified aerial phenomena. The, the jargon nowadays. The aurora lights behind Earth's beautiful curves was being recorded from the ISS when he saw a string of really weird lights moving in a really weird way. He labeled the video Space Guests. Wagner tweeted the vid, which apparently shows the aurora, Australis, near Antarctica, and then all of a sudden this blob of organized lights just cruises on over the globe. Looks like a blob of like glitter just trucking across space. Like what is that? Of course NASA didn't follow up. Like what are they gonna say? Oh yeah, those are uh, stars that move and blink, I think. I mean, no, space junk. Yeah, space debris and swamps and things. Also, what a lame excuse, space junk? Okay, so you're saying there's lots of litter up there, that's what you're saying? That's what just zipped over my house silently, defying gravity and lasered up my cow? Yeah, I don't think so, NASA. Number three. Chris Hadfield, retired Canadian astronaut, engineer, fighter pilot, and musician. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Hadfield flew two missions and also served as commander on the International Space Station. Before his career as an astronaut, he served in the Canadian Armed Forces for 25 years as an air commander fighter pilot. So he has the credentials to say the least. In 1992, Hadfield was accepted into the Canadian astronaut program. He first flew in space in 1995 and since then, he says he's seen tons of stuff up there just zipping around that even a man with all those credentials says he can't explain. Quote, I've seen countless things in the sky but he has a pretty cool take on it. He doesn't keep it on the DL, he doesn't boast, and he doesn't panic. Seems like Chris has the mentality like, quote, to see something in the sky that you don't understand and then to immediately conclude it's intelligent life from another solar system is the height of foolishness and lack of logic. However, Chris seems to have a little dirt on Mars that maybe we all don't. He said, I think the fundamental question is that Mars was a lot like Earth four billion years ago when life first formed. So if it happened here, did it happen there? It would be evident somewhere in the geologic records. All we need is one fossil for proof. He thinks there could be potentially alien life in the clouds of Venus or on the distant moons of one of our gas giants. Researchers have suggested that there could be microbial life in the clouds of Venus because of the presence of ammonia, which on Earth is a key indicator of aquatic life. Aquatic life, eh? Atlanteans? Hadfield on the UAP phenomenon, quote, we have seven people living up there. We've been sending people to space since I was born. I spent half a year off planet looking everywhere. It makes no sense at all that intelligent life somewhere from not our solar system could cross interstellar space and just sneak around and only be caught on some strange video by fighter pilots. It just doesn't pass any basic sniff test or logic. It's fun, it's exciting, but if you use reason, the whole argument falls apart." End quote. Hmm, okay, Chris Hadfield, keep your secrets for now, you polite Canadian you. Wait till people start looking into Paul Hellier, another very polite Canadian with some secrets of his own. Until then, you keep distracting us up there with that guitar, Chris. I see you, Jake Sully. Number two, Michael Collins. NASA veteran and the very first driver up there, Mr. Michael Collins himself, served as command module pilot on the historic Apollo 11 mission in 1969. When Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon for the very first time saying those very first famous lines we all know so well, Collins was back parking that thing up there. Mr. Collins stayed up there by himself in lunar orbit waiting for the safe return of his crewmates. I can't even stay in a basement with the lights off by myself. Imagine being up there just drifting in the currents of matter, like being in the middle of the ocean. Yeah, no way, dude. The astronaut retired from NASA in 1970 and spent his free time answering questions on Twitter. Apparently, he has gotten some really interesting buzz. Mr. Collins invited the interweb to chat saying, quote, are we alone? Hashtag ask Michael Collins. And boy, oh boy, did he get some responses. Everything from wackos who like aliens to very, very high ranked generals and pilots who are apparently also wackos who like aliens for talking about this. Collins, quote, I used to think that NASA sent me to the wrong place, to the moon. 
because I think Mars is a much, much more interesting place, end quote. Collins has talked about it in the past about the possibility of alien life existing beyond Earth and doesn't shy away from discussing the topic in full. In 1999, for instance, he even argued on the topic of life developing in other parts of this infinite cosmos. So maybe it has then. He wrote in his book saying, quote, I am alone now truly alone and absolutely isolated from any known life. Although I may feel like I'm the same person, I also feel that I am different from other people. I have been places and done things you simply would not believe. Collins circled the moon once every two hours. What's scarier, walking on an unknown rock that apparently no one's ever visited or flying all the way around it by yourself in the pitch black with no communications? Collins achieved the rank of Major General. He left NASA in 1970 to join the State Department and later became director of the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum in Washington. One of the most key players in this whole thing. Michael Collins sadly passed in 2021. Number one, Buzz Aldrin. Of course, the poster child for the whole phenomenon itself, Mr. Edwin Eugene Aldrin Jr. American astronaut, engineer, fighter pilot with a doctorate of science in astronautics. This guy is overqualified, okay? Three spacewalks in 1966, Gemini 12 mission in 1969, Apollo 11 mission. He and mission commander Neil Armstrong were the first two people to land on the moon. Quote, there was something out there, close enough to be observed. What could it be? According to Aldrin on Apollo 11 to the moon, quote, I observed a light out the window that appeared to be moving alongside us. What could that have been other than a spacecraft from another country or another world? It was either the rocket that had separated from us or the four panels that moved away when we extracted the lander, right? After he returned from his missions, he was convinced he saw aliens while he was out there. Credentials aside, he took a lie detector test, people, which he passed with flying colors. In an interview with C-SPAN Buzz, he talked about the future potential of Earth's moon for humanity. He added a little extra info that might have gained the spark to go back regarding a certain monolith on a moon. Quote, visit the moon Phobos of Mars. There's a monolith there, a very unusual structure on this little potato object that goes around Mars once in every seven hours. When people find out about that, they're gonna say, who put that there? And you bet, Buzz, I'll be the first one to ask that. Starting off this list in our number five spot, we have Project Grudge Report 13. Okay, so I've read quite a few different UFO sighting stories and stories of alleged alien abductions, and this is fully one of the most terrifying that I have ever heard of. So basically, the story starts off in March of 1956 when Air Force Sergeant Jonathan P. Lovett was assisting Major William William <laughs> was assisting Major William Cunningham in the White Sands missile testing grounds near Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. The pair were out searching for debris from a recent rocket test when Major Cunningham heard a loud scream. His first thought was that Sergeant Lovett had been bitten by a snake, so he went around to help aid his partner when he allegedly saw something he never expected. He recounted seeing the sergeant being dragged away by some sort of long serpentine arm that had wrapped around his legs. Whatever this creature was, it was connected to a hovering silver disc that was in the air about 15 feet away. The Major stood there in horror as he watched this creature and the sergeant retreat into the craft which then rose vertically into the sky. Of course, he radioed for help and while he was taken to the hospital for observation, search teams were sent out immediately. It wouldn't happen until three days later that they would find the body of Sergeant Lovett only 10 miles from the site where he was said to have disappeared from. The autopsy performed on him later also only raised more questions than answers as his body was severe severely harmed. So of course there was an investigation that happened and many people claim this investigation was detailed in a 600 page document labeled Project Grudge Report 13. But the problem with this is that no official information on Report 13 exists and the US government denies its very existence. Though Grudge Reports 1 through 12 have been declassified along with Report 14, no official mention or accounting of Report 13 exists and the story solely relies on second-hand accounts of the horrible incident. In our number four spot today, we have the cigar-shaped UFO. Okay, so let's set the stage. It's 2.45 a.m. on July 24th, 1948, and there are 20 passengers aboard a twin-engine propeller plane that is at 5,000 feet being flown from Houston to Atlanta by pilot Clarence S. Childs and co-pilot John B. Whitted. Out of the 20 passengers on board, 
19 of them are asleep at these early morning hours, and everything seems to be going as per usual, until it wasn't. The two pilots and the one passenger who was awake all witnessed the same thing about 20 miles southeast of Montgomery, Alabama. About a week after the incident, the pilot explained what he had seen by saying, quote, It was clear there were no wings present, that it was powered by some jet or other type of power shooting flame from the rear some 50 feet. There were two rows of windows which indicated an upper and a lower deck, and from inside these windows a very bright light was glowing. Underneath the ship there was a blue glow of light. By his estimates, he watched the UFO for about 10 seconds before it completely vanished. The co-pilot gave a similar explanation and also added, quote, The object was cigar shaped and seemed to be about 100 feet in length. The fuselage appeared to be about three times the circumference of a B-29 fuselage. It had two rows of windows, an upper and a lower. The windows were very large and seemed square. They were white with light, which seemed to be caused by some type of combustion. I asked Captain Childs what we had just seen, and he said that he didn't know. Well, this is obviously all very strange and peculiar. What has driven UFO enthusiasts even more is the fact that this strange sighting was of course later investigated by the US government, but the results of that investigation have allegedly been mostly destroyed. Does that mean that they found something they aren't willing to share yet? Some believe that perhaps the pilots and the passenger witnessed a secret Soviet spy craft, while others believe it was definitely something of the extraterrestrial variety. In our number 3 spot today we have the Lubbock Incident. On August 25th, 1951 in Lubbock, Texas, a group of scientists from the Texas Technical College were all hanging out in the backyard of geology professor Dr. W.I. Robinson. They were all just chilling, enjoying each other's company, until around 9.20pm when they saw something very strange. It was a V-shaped formation of 15 to 30 bluish green lights passing overhead. They were completely confused over what it could be, but figured that the lights would likely reappear, which they did. About an hour later, the lights reappeared, and at this point, all these scientists knew that they had witnessed something exceptionally interesting, but what was it? The scientists weren't the only ones to witness the lights either. About 350 miles away in Albuquerque, New Mexico, an employee of the Atomic Energy Commission's top secret Sandia Corporation, who had a high High level Q security clearance had been sitting outside with his wife, quote, gazing at the night sky, commenting on how beautiful it was, when both of them were startled at the sight of a huge airplane flying swiftly and silently over their home. On the aft edge of the wings, there were six to eight pairs of soft, glowing bluish lights. There were more sightings as well, all reporting a similar thing. The group of scientists began investigating, tracking the lights, which they witnessed 12 more times. They measured the angle of the lights, they tracked the speed, and they attempted, unsuccessfully, to try and measure the UFO's altitude. Here's the deal with this though. The government did end up investigating, but the official explanation for these lights is the most cryptic message I've ever seen. It read, quote, I thought that the professor's lights might have been some kind of birds reflecting the light from mercury vapor street lights, but I was wrong. They weren't birds. They weren't refracted light. But they weren't spaceships. The lights that the professor saw have been positively identified as a very commonplace and easily explainable natural phenomenon. I can't divulge exactly the way the answer was found because it is an interesting story of how a scientist set up complete instrumentation to track down the lights. Telling the story would lead to his identity and in exchange for his story I promised the man complete anonymity. Despite people claiming that the mystery has been solved by this explanation, people are left with a lot more questions than answers. In our number 2 spot today we have the Shag Harbor Incident. This UFO encounter is often referred to as Canada's Roswell, so I was shocked that I hadn't heard of it before. Basically, this incident took place on October 4th, 1967, when an unknown object crashed into the water near Shag Harbor, which is a tiny town in Nova Scotia. There were at least 11 people who witnessed this object as it crashed, and many people claimed to have heard a whistling sound followed by a loud bang when the crash took place. The witnesses that claimed to have seen the UFO were all doing a bunch of different things at the time. One couple was just sitting on their porch, but the two witnesses that really get me are a flight pilot and a ship captain. On Air Canada Flight 305, First Officer Robert Ralph pointed out to Captain Pierre Charbonneau that there was something strange at the left side of the aircraft. They reported an object tracking along on a parallel course a few miles away and described it as a brilliantly lit rectangular object with a string of smaller lights trailing the object. Shortly after 
after they first noticed it, there was a large but silent explosion near the unknown object, and then two minutes later, there was a second explosion, but this one faded to a blue cloud. As for the ship captain, Captain Leo Howard Mercy, he saw four blips on his Decca radar that were totally stationary. This led to him looking up to the sky, and that is when he saw four bright objects sitting in a rectangular formation about 28 kilometers from the vessel's window. He wasn't the only one who saw it on board. The entire crew of nearly 20 fishermen stood on deck and watched. A man named Lori Wickens was another one of the witnesses, and he and some of his friends ended up calling the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, because they saw a huge object floating in the Atlantic Ocean about a thousand feet off of the shore. This is all super weird, and not only the RCMP, but also the Royal Canadian Navy and the Royal Canadian Air Force became involved in investigation, but nothing was ever recovered or found, but it was also revealed that all commercial, private, and military aircrafts along the eastern seaboard were accounted for, so what could have all these witnesses seen? Since they have never officially identified what it was in the official Government of Canada documents, it is listed as a UFO. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the Westall Incident. Taking it back to 1966, we have the largest mass UFO sighting in Australia that at the time was largely ignored. This incident took place when over 300 students and staff members of a school in Melbourne all witnessed multiple UFOs silently flying through the air before they landed in a nearby field. While there's been a ton of speculation about this incident in the many years it's been, one witness account stands out among the rest, and that is the account made by the science teacher from the school, Andrew Greenwood. He was alerted to the UFO event by a hysterical student, and when he went outside to see for himself, everything changed. Previously a skeptic of UFO stories, Andrew's mind was abruptly changed when he saw, as he described it, a round silver object about the size of a car with a metal rod sticking up in the air. He went on to explain that suddenly, five planes came and surrounded the object, all while more people were gathering to watch. He called what happened next the most amazing flying he has ever seen, explaining that quote, every time they got too close to the object it would slowly accelerate, then rapidly accelerate, and then move away from them and stop. Then they would take off after it again, and the same thing would happen. This went on for about 20 minutes before the mysterious object just vanished. As weird as this all was, what was almost weirder was what happened next. Firstly, the headmaster of the school is said to have tried to put a stop to anyone talking about the incident at all, threatening severe punishment to any student or staff who was caught speaking about it, and when the Royal Australian Air Force contacted him, he refused to talk to them at all about it. There have also been stories of witnesses getting visits from people warning them not to speak of the incident. Andrew explained, quote, when he asked the physical education teacher to describe what she had seen herself so that he could compare it with his own observation, she just wouldn't say anything. Another witness who did talk to Andrew and described what she had seen in great detail, just 30 minutes later refused to speak to him and wouldn't say a word. Was this because of the threats from the headmaster? Or was something else going on here? This is definitely one strange UFO story that leaves behind a lot of questions. Number 5 on this list is Helen Sharman. Dr. Helen Sharman was the first ever British woman to go to space. She went in 1991 on a mission to the Soviet space station. Dr. Helen Sharman is extremely well educated, renowned in her community, and is one of the very few people in the history of humankind who's actually been to space. Therefore, I hold her opinion in extremely high regard when we're referring to something like extraterrestrial life. And her opinion is that said life is already here. Dr. Helen Sharman told The Observer's Magazine that aliens exist. There's no two ways about it. There must be all sorts of different forms of life. She went on to say in her interview that it's possible they're here right now and we simply can't see them. Like I said earlier, this is an actual astronaut who's saying this right now. Someone who very clearly knows far more about this than your average Joe and whose opinion should be acknowledged. Now just because one person believes that alien life could potentially be on Earth, well that's far from fact. But oftentimes when we think about aliens and the potential of them being on our planet, it can easily get chalked up to some mumbo jumbo from people who aren't well researched or properly educated on the topic. That certainly can't be said about Helen Sharman and I think that the fact that someone of this background is openly coming out and giving this opinion shows that the culture surrounding aliens is changing. I think that as time goes on we'll see a lot more individuals like Helen come out and express this opinion, further adding to the validity of alien life living among us. 
Number four on this list is Oumuamua. Oumuamua was first discovered on October 19th in 2017, and it holds the title as being the very first discovered interstellar object to visit our solar system. Now, even though this object isn't necessarily evidence of aliens being here on Earth, a lot of people look to it as evidence of aliens' existence as a whole. The biggest name on this list of alien believers being Avi Loeb. Avi is a Harvard professor for astrophysics and has made it known that he doesn't think this object entering our solar system is your typical comet or asteroid. He's come out and said that this object is actually an alien probe sent to search for other life in the universe. In fact, he wrote, Oumuamua may be a fully operational probe sent intentionally to Earth's vicinity by an alien civilization. One of the biggest reasons he thinks this and others believe it is due to this object's strange movement. The speed at which this object is flying doesn't seem to fit in with our current laws of physics. The object is simply moving too fast for the ground gravitational pull that we believe to be acting upon it. It's also flipping and maneuvering itself in a way that doesn't seem to make any sense. Now this thing is wildly far away, so even though we can get a rough estimate of how big it is, and it certainly is very sizable, it's hard to know for sure exactly what this thing is. He has faced some backlash in the scientific community for his claims, but then again, everybody who comes out and talks about aliens typically does. All we know for sure about this thing is that it came from a completely different solar system and seems to be accelerating in speed, which doesn't make any sense to anyone. I don't want to wholeheartedly jump on the alien train simply because of this logic, but I also don't think that immediately writing off a Harvard astrophysics professor is the smart thing to do either. Number three on this list is alien bacteria. One of the biggest knocks against any argument associated with aliens is that our solar system hasn't shown any signs of life except for Earth. This isn't necessarily true though, based on a recent study that has come out in regards to Venus. Venus is one heck of a planet and certainly not somewhere that I would want to live. The storms are mighty, the temperature is way too hot, and acid regularly rains down from the sky. Not the ideal location if you ask me. One thing that Venus is also home to is a rare poisonous gas, phosphine. Now you're probably thinking, well how would a poisonous gas indicate any signs of alien life? Wouldn't it indicate the opposite? And in most cases you might be right, however phosphine is almost always linked to the presence of life. On Earth, phosphine is produced by microorganisms as they digest organic matter. This is why we consider it to be a biosignature and an indicator of life. Venus is certainly different from Earth, and we can't simply apply what makes sense here to Venus without asking some questions. However, this is a strong indicator from scientists that life is certainly possible from Venus. We've also seen before that Mars might contain some life. These two planets may not house the typical alien life that you may picture in your brain, but a bacteria from Venus or Mars is just as alien as somebody flying down in a UFO. Is it not possible that somehow, through our extensive history, debris from Venus or debris from Mars landed on Earth and developed life here? Maybe we never even realized that this life was alien to begin with. Number two on this list is microorganisms. We just talked about how Venus could be the host to life, bacteria or other small organisms that we've yet to identify. Well, one of the biggest arguments against aliens living among us is that we haven't seen them yet. Sure, there have been some stories here and there, but nothing on a major and global scale. What if we aren't looking properly though? What if our understanding of life doesn't match with what an alien life form is? Scientists have thought deeply about this possibility and what this could mean. This life, seeing as it would not compute with our definition of life, would actually live in what experts refer to as a shadow biosphere. Now, this shadow biosphere isn't some alternate dimension or ghost realm but it's a biosphere with organisms that have a completely different biochemistry than we're familiar with. We're made up of carbon and nitrogen, but why are we automatically assuming that an alien would be made up of this as well? It could be just as likely that alien beings are made up of other elements. If this was the case, then it's most likely on a microscopic scale, and that's why we haven't been able to recognize them yet. We currently have a very limited way of studying microbes, and we need to be testing for a very specific microbe to know what it is. If we aren't searching for the proper microbe though, then it's very likely we could miss it. A lot of scientists have gotten on board with this shadow biosphere train and talked about its legitimacy. Once again, this is 
isn't damning proof that there are aliens out there, but it does mean that there isn't damning proof against them either. Just because we don't see alien life, it doesn't mean that it's not here. Number one on this list is the 2004 UFO sightings. Now I just used this point in a previous video called Top 5 Scary Discoveries the Government Doesn't Want You to Know About, and I do hate reusing the same point, but it just has to be included in this video as well. For those who aren't aware, the 2004 UFO sightings happened very close to San Diego by the United States Navy. These sightings were by multiple people and even caught on video. Just like in our last Top 5 video, I want to play some of the footage so you guys can see what I'm referring to here. Those videos were caught by the US Navy and weren't released to the public until years after it happened. As you can see in those clips, the UFO that is flying through the sky doesn't look like anything man-made at all. The way it moves through the air is unlike anything we've been able to build. For instance, one of the Navy officers reported seeing it cruise at 60,000 feet and then immediately dropping to only 50 feet above the sea. It did this without making a sonic boom and did it almost instantly. That defies our current understanding of flying objects and leads a lot of people to believe this was from another intelligent species. Now, no one is sure if this object was being piloted by some sort of alien or if it was an alien probe operating by itself. I should also note that a UFO sighting is an undeniable proof of alien life. It might just be something that we don't understand. However, the way that it flies through space has got to make us wonder. If something is flying through our air like that and it's that advanced, is it possible that something like that could have landed without us knowing? I think that might be a fair assumption. And if that's possible, then is it also possible that some sort of alien creature got out of said object and is now living among us? Frankly, I think that's also a fair assumption too. We obviously don't know for sure, but I think that this footage is some of the clearest proof that aliens living among us might be a reality. Number five, build a UFO. In the 1989 interview that started these leaks, the claim sounded like Hollywood sci-fi. Months later though, when his identity was revealed, Bob said he worked at a secret facility that I'll talk more about later, where alien technology was being reverse engineered, meaning, you know, taken apart to figure out how it worked and whether the Pentagon could uh, duplicate it. Look. The premise seems a lot less absurd now. Bob said that his job was to help with the reverse engineering of one of nine flying saucers, which he alleged were extraterrestrial in origin. He claims that one of the flying saucers, the one he coined the sport model, was manufactured out of a metallic substance similar in appearance and touch to liquid titanium. Bob said that the propulsion of the studied vehicle ran on an antimatter reactor and was fueled by the chemical element with atomic number 115, which once again, I'll touch on later, I promise. In a subsequent interview that November, Bob appeared unmasked and under his own name, where he claimed that his job interview for work at the facility was with contractor EG&G and that his employer was the United States Navy. Bob said the craft he was working on was dismantled, and the reactor he studied was topped by a sphere or semi-sphere which emitted a force field capable of repulsing human flesh. He further explains that the craft was split into two main levels. So the reactor was positioned at the center of the upper level, with an antenna extending to the top, surrounded by three gravity amplifiers. These were connected to gravity emitters on the lower level, which can rotate 180 degrees to output a gravity beam or anti-gravity wave. In 1989, Bob said the seeds of the saucer he saw were approximately tiny human sized, and that he had seen alien cadavers of a corresponding size. He's mentioned that the main craft he worked on would aim its belly to the target, and then bring all of the amplifiers fires to power and fly off in that direction with the belly or bottom forward. If that description of a spacecraft tilting sounds familiar, I'm assuming you're familiar with the uh, gimbal UFO? So the Pentagon released the video back in 2017, where naval pilots encountered a fleet of uh, the unknown craft off of the coast of Florida in 2015, and have since had dozens of similar encounters. So in that specific video, there's a mechanistic turn against the wind without deceleration, which means a craft without rotors, heat signatures, tail fins, and no tail number, and it was moving in a way that is counterintuitive to aeronautics. So when Bob saw that video, he said it had to be a gravity propelled craft, which meant the propulsion system that he described. So okay, if you don't believe me on that one, how about we look at another now famous UFO incident, the 2004 Tic Tac encounter. I've talked about this many, many times. So the Navy pilot who engaged the Tic Tac, Black Aces Commander Dave Fravor, says he doesn't believe the astonishing craft was made on Earth and that the propulsion might be anti-gravity. So when Bob was shown the Tic Tac video for the first time, it immediately reminded him of the sport mode, which, you know, like I said, that was his name for the craft stashed in the desert. And he says it's the exact same propulsion system. Former Pentagon intelligence officer Lou Elizondo was in charge of ATEC 
step, the secret Pentagon study. He told the I team one goal of the project was to determine the physics of UFOs, you know, how they can achieve the seemingly impossible. The military came to believe that the craft relied on special metamaterials, stuff that can't be made with known technology. And hey, Bob made similar claims decades ago and was ridiculed. So what do you know? Now the Pentagon's on the same page all of a sudden. Number four, what is Area 51? So sure, today everybody knows that Area 51 is the common name of a highly classified United States Air Force facility within the Nevada Test and Training Range. As a remote detachment administered by Edwards Air Force Base, the facility is officially called Homey Airport or Groom Lake, depending on who you ask. Okay, I feel like I'm forgetting something. Don't tell me. I'm sure it'll come to me eventually. Oh, I got it. It's home to all things unknown, and lots of alien and UFO believers, such as myself, are pretty sure that that's where all the flying disks and more tend to be housed. It's commonly thought to support the development and testing of experimental aircraft and weapon systems. Now, it has never been declared a secret base, but all research and occurrences in Area 51 are top secret or sensitive compartmented information. So make of that what you will. The CIA only publicly acknowledged the base's existence on June 25th of 2013, following a Freedom of Information Information Act request filed in 05 and declassified documents detailing its history and purpose. So, how does Bob play into all this? Well, we're gonna go back to 1989 when he appeared in that interview with investigative reporter George Knapp on Las Vegas TV station Kloss under the pseudonym Dennis and with his face hidden to discuss his employment at S4, a subsidiary facility he claimed exists near the Nellis Air Force Base installation known as Area 51. And once again, this was back in 1989, before Area 51 was the common knowledge it is today. He claimed that said facility was adjacent to Papoose Lake, which is located south of the main Area 51 facility at Groom Lake. He claimed the site consisted of concealed aircraft hangars built into a mountainside. He said that while walking down a hallway at S4 once, he briefly glanced through a door window and saw what he interpreted as two men in lab coats facing down and talking to something with long arms. Now, he doesn't think he saw an actual alien, but speculated that he saw a doll used as a reference for the size of the alleged aliens. So everything I'm discussing today about Bob probably took place at that mysterious place out in the desert. Area 51 is also believed to house material recovered at Roswell, the study of their occupants, and the manufacturing of aircraft based on alien technology. And you know, also might be a place to host meetings or joint undertakings with extraterrestrials. It tends to be where the development of exotic energy weapons for the Strategic Defense Initiative or other weapons programs happens, possibly where they're working on projects to do with weather control, time travel and teleportation technology, and exotic propulsion systems related to the Aurora program. So many of these tend to do with, you know, underground facilities at Groom or Papoose Lake. So, you know, the S4 location first talked about by Bob, which is 8.5 miles south and includes claims of a transcontinental underground railroad system and a disappearing airstrip named the Cheshire Airstrip after Lewis Carroll's Cheshire Cat, which briefly appears when water is sprayed onto its camouflaged asphalt and engineering based on alien technology. Number three, contact with Zeta Reticuli. So Bob has claimed that during his, you know, joining the program, he read briefing documents describing the historical involvement of Earth for the past 10,000 years with extraterrestrial beings described as gray aliens from a planet orbiting the twin binary system, Zeta Reticuli. As of September 2019, no extrasolar planets have been found in the system, according to government experts, but we all know that they can lie to us about that. So for the uninitiated, what the heck is Zeta Reticuli? So this is a wide binary star system in the southern constellation of Reticulum. From the southern hemisphere, the pair can be seen with the regular eye as a double star in very dark skies. Based on parallax measurements, this system is located at a distance of about 39.3 light years from Earth. Both stars are solar analogs that have characteristics similar to those of the Sun. They belong to the Zeta Herculeum moving group of stars that share a common origin. So you might be asking, okay Alexa, what does this have to do with aliens? So does anybody remember Skinny Bob? If not, I'll refresh your memory. So a very curious video showed up on YouTube in 2011, showing a collection of leaked videos where you can see an alien being interrogated by some sort of government agency of sorts. It's a typical gray type entity shown being interviewed and examined, supposedly as part of some sort of diplomatic exchange. And here's the moment you've been waiting for. He says he's from the Zeta Reticuli star system, sent as part of an envoy to discuss matters of mutual concern. According to the videos, the aliens would be escorted by special officers and only meet with high ranking officials. Although several aliens are claimed to have been present, the one most prominently featured was given the nickname Skinny Bob. The alien appears as a very thin, sludged over figure with an oversized bald head, slit-like mouth, large eyes that seem expressive and blink, and claw-like hands. Now there was apparently a whole series of interviews conducted with the creature between 1942 and 69, although only a few clips have managed to get leaked out. The most well-known clip simply shows Skinny Bob sitting at a table, apparently in a telepathic interview, after which we see footage of the alien from head to toe, showing its disproportionately long arms and overall build. 
After that, there was a shot of it within a pool of some sort of liquid where it was supposedly sleep. Now, according to the videos, the aliens were often filmed without their knowledge or agreement, with document uh, 072-E supposedly describing an incident in 1961 where three of the beings realized they were being secretly filmed by a hidden device, which was considered a violation of their agreement. There was a treaty that stipulated that photographs and filming of the entities would not be allowed unless specific permission was given. The diplomatic exchange of it all matches up with what we know about Area 51 being a place for secret meetings and more. Number two, men in black are racing history. So yeah, it's no secret the government has the power to erase or cover up whatever they want. And what they've done to Bob in an attempt to discredit him is a very clear example of that control. So Bob is adamant that his employment and education records have been erased and modified. So um, remember how I mentioned that he's a physicist? So Bob claims to obtain master's degrees in physics from MIT and in electronics from Caltech, but mysteriously, both universities show no record of him. Now I get one institution losing records can be explained, you know, as like a clerical error, but both losing records are a little suspicious. Earlier, I also mentioned how Bob claimed that his job interview for work at the facility was with contractor EG&G, and that his employer was the United States Navy, right? Well, um, EG&G stated it had no records on him, and his employment at a Nellis Air Force Base subsidiary has also been discredited by skeptics, as well as the United States Air Force. Once again, discredited or simply just erased by the government. Bob claims to have worked as a physicist during his tenure at the Los Alamos Messon Physics Facility but an inquiry into his position revealed his role to have been a technician for a contractor firm, and that he worked neither as a physicist or for Los Alamos. Not to sound like a broken record, but it's clearly the men in black at work here, and skeptics just need to understand that. Number 1. Element 115 Alrighty, the moment we've all been waiting for. What the heck is Element 115, and what does it do? So Bob has claimed that the propulsion of the studied vehicle that he reverse engineered ran on an antimatter reactor and was fueled by the chemical element with atomic number 115, which at the time was provisionally named unempentium and had not yet been artificially created. It was first synthesized in 2003 and later named Moscovium. He said that the propulsion system relied on a stable isotope of E-115, which allegedly generates a gravity wave that allowed the vehicle to fly and to evade visual detection by bending light around it. Now, no stable isotope isotopes of Moscovium have yet been synthesized. All have proven extremely radioactive, decaying in a few hundred milliseconds. In 2017, Bob's workplace was raided by the FBI and local police, which he theorizes was to recover Element 115, a substance he said he, uh, you know, he kind of kept from the government lab. I don't blame him. Number 5. Well, first and foremost, if you were looking for any proof that the government definitely knows more about aliens than they let on, how about from the mouth of the three letter organizations themselves? The CIA released a tweet in 2014, oh wow, obviously it was meant to be taken in a joking manner, but still pretty illuminating, saying that throughout the 50s and 60s, they estimate that 50% of all sightings of unexplained aerial phenomena and UFOs were simply the CIA testing new aircraft. Out of context, the CIA admits they were behind 50% of all UFO sightings is an extremely attention grabbing headline and probably what I should have named this video would have got you to click better. And it is, it is an attention grabbing headline. At the time they were testing the Lockheed U-2 spy plane, codenamed Dragon Lady, which was able to fly at altitudes thought unreachable by a one manned aircraft at the time. We know the CIA will always be a little bit more technologically advanced than they're willing to let on, that's just the nature of shadowy governments. But the conspiracy theorist in me has to wonder, is it even just the littlest bit possible that them releasing this could be a misinformation campaign? I mean this is just what they're willing to admit, right? Who's to say what they won't admit? What if they put stuff like this out there so the next time you see something odd in the sky, you just dismiss it thinking, oh that's just the CIA testing airplanes instead of the more logical, reasonable answer that it's an alien spacecraft observing you from up above. And what if all I'm saying is just wild speculating and tinfoil hat level conspiracies because I'm trying to get views on video? It's more likely than you think. But them admitting they're responsible for most UFO sightings intones to me that they're aware of a lot more UFO sightings that are reported. Makes you wonder how much they research them all. Do you think they look at every blurry cell phone camera video posted to Reddit or just the really serious ones that make the news? I'm hoping to get some answers someday, but I have a feeling that some of those answers are in this video. It won't all be wild speculation, I promise. And hey, if you want to see more alien stuff, click through. We've got boxes full of declassified documents, NASA stories, and videos that are just out of this world. Get it? So stay subscribed and stay scared, and I'll see you there. Number four, the guy Hoddle memo. So 
it's a pretty much an open book secret that the three letter agencies have known about aliens in some way or another since they've started writing things down. They don't hide it or pretend to hide it anymore, which is nice. They finally admitted that Area 51 even exists for the first time a couple years ago, so we could all use a little openness in our day to day. Let's take a look at one of the FBI's most talked about and most viewed documents, the Guy Hoddle memo. And despite being one of the most seen FBI memos, it's but a single page document that was never followed up on. Hmm. Well, it sounds like we should follow up on it. Guy Hoddle was the head of the FBI field office in Washington, and his report was addressed to the head of the FBI, one J. Edgar Hoover. The contents of the report were simple, but shocking. It detailed the descriptive encounter of an agent making a physical sighting of what they believed to be a UFO, stated three years after the Roswell incident, but it was reported in New Mexico for what it's worth. Here's a quote from the memo. The saucers were described as being circular in shape with raised centers, approximately 50 feet in diameter. Each one was occupied by three bodies of human shape but only three feet tall, dressed in metallic cloth of a very fine texture. Each body was bandaged in a manner similar to blackout suits used by speed flyers and test pilots. Now if you ask me, that is almost too perfect, isn't it? I mean the memo lines up nearly perfectly with the stereotypical like cartoon description of aliens being little gray or green men flying around in flying saucers around New Mexico. The memo goes on to read that the agent claims they had found the saucers because an FBI high powered radar in the area had detected it, and this radar detecting it had interfered with the controlling mechanism of the crafts. But despite all of this, which really seems like it's the paper trail screaming proving hey aliens are out there you should go check them out, the memo ends by saying no further evaluation was attempted, and the HODL memo was never followed up on, presumably crumpled up and thrown away. Director Hoover I guess thought it wasn't worth his time and disregarded it, leaving it now as nothing more than an incredibly odd piece of history. Number 3. Project Blue Book Well here's the thing, even if Director Hoover at the FBI didn't see fit to look into the HODL memo, there were definitely other organizations that were looking into UFOs. Maybe it's not just the FBI, but I can tell you that the Air Force sure was. If you're an experienced UFO enthusiast, perhaps you're already very familiar with Project Blue Book, but if you're not, hey, let's talk about it. The project was officially started in 1952 and terminated in 1969. And the project had two main goals. One, confirm if UFOs were a threat to national security and two, scientifically analyze any UFO related data. Well that seems like pretty strong evidence to me, not that the project existed to see if UFOs are real, but rather to determine if they were a threat. That seems like they're writing and admitting like, no we know, we just want to know if they're scary. And is that not the most human sentiment you've ever heard? If you guys learned nothing from Avatar, we gotta be making friends with aliens, not being afraid of them. In the years of Project Blue Book's operations, a stunning 12,618 reports were filed and collected, and those are just the ones that are officially recorded. Of those, interestingly, there were an individual 700 reports that were found to be unexplainable after research and intense analysis. Isn't that Interesting. Now, a great number of these reports turned out to be the U-2 spy plane that we mentioned all the way back in point number five, if you remember that far away. But that still leaves 700 completely unexplained sightings of aircraft that the USAF looked into and could not find answers for. The project was ultimately shut down in 1969, with the official explanation being given that number one, no UFO reported, investigated, and evaluated by the Air Force has ever given any indication of threat to our national security. And number two, there has been no evidence submitted to or discovered by the Air Force that sightings categorized as unidentified represent technological developments or principles beyond the range of present day scientific knowledge. And number three, there has been no evidence indicating the sightings categorized as unidentified are extraterrestrial vehicles. Oh, well that sounds like kind of a bit of a bummer, doesn't it? They went through thousands of documents and declared that none of it was worthwhile evidence to suggest that aliens exist. Well it's a shame that we're never going to mention any more things of the Air Force on this video or any more things about pilots encountering aliens. I mean, that really blows, I mean, except for our next point. Take a listen. Number 2. The UAP Report Very recently the Pentagon declassified a series of documents known internally as the UAP Report and it was basically the sequel to Project Blue Book, the streaming follow up. And yeah, every single time we have an alien video I'm probably going to have a little meltdown where I talk about how last year the government confirmed that they researched UFOs and that's what they spend your money on and no one seemed to care about this, they just slipped it under the rug. I, I guess we were kind of busy with other stuff, but still. What happened to our curious minds people? We learned that the various three letter agencies agencies in the states had been researching, analyzing, and scouting out sightings of UFOs, mostly because pilots just could not stop reporting them during training ops. One pilot, Lieutenant Ryan Graves, claims that he saw hundreds, maybe thousands in his
his career as a Navy pilot. One of the more famous ones is the Tic Tac sighting, referring to a massive oval shaped aircraft that was spotted by two pilots. This one comes from 2004, and the two veteran pilots, Commander David Fravor and Lieutenant Commander Jim Slate, were the ones who called it in. Two respected, trustworthy Navy veterans. Their report reads that the objects were spotted almost out of nowhere, some 80,000 feet in the air, which would then descend rapidly towards the Pacific Ocean, then stop at around 2,000 feet and hover in place. Very normal airplane behavior. They would drop out of radar range or shoot directly up into the sky on a 90 degree angle. For weeks, Navy crew was watching these objects trying to determine just what they were. They certainly weren't American in origin, and they weren't recognized by any other organizations. To confirm what they'd seen, Slate and Fravor were set off on a reconnaissance mission to get eyes on it. What they found was more confusing than either of the two men could ever have imagined. They reported back that the object they were seeing was like a giant tic tac, white colored, oval shaped, and 40 feet long. Far too big to be a drone, and it didn't maneuver in a way like an aircraft would, making erratic movements, staying out of reach of radars, as if it knew it was trying to stay undetected. The pilots flew towards a rendezvous point to touch down and presumably cracked their windows open and asked each other, hey, what the hell was that? But as they flew towards the LZ, the UAP flew past them at a breakneck speed and then disappeared entirely. When questioned about it, Fravor said that it was unlike any aircraft he had ever seen in his life. I mean, that guy flew planes like every day for years, so he probably knows a thing or two. Number one, non-terrestrial officers. Now, if you're like me, you're probably frustrated that you know the truth is so close within grasp behind closed doors. To know in your heart of hearts that there are answers to the unexplained just out of sight would drive you to do something crazy. Now, for most of us, all we can do is sit and speculate and maybe watch some lovely top five videos of a very handsome host talking about aliens. But for one Gary McKinnon, a Scottish computer programmer, he decided that wasn't enough and decided to take matters into his own hands. McKinnon was a genius computer hacker and had his sights set on the biggest prize he could imagine, going after NASA's servers to see if they had any hidden alien data just waiting to be found in what was described as the biggest military hack of all time. Quite the conversation starter. Why would anyone risk their career, freedom, and livelihood on this? Well, Gary wanted the truth and he would do anything to get it. McKinnon claims he had insider knowledge that confirmed the US had suppressed anti-gravity technology, reverse engineered from UFOs, and free energy. In his own statement, McKinnon said, This should not be kept hidden from the public when pensioners can't even pay their fuel bills. Yeah. Well, so what did McKinnon find? Well, he didn't find proof of the reverse engineered UFOs that he'd been hoping for, but he found quite a lot that was remarkably illuminating. First up, a 400 page document called The Disclosure Project, outlining testimonials from government agents across multiple branches of service reporting all their sightings and scientific analysis on unexplained flying objects. That would already be pretty impressive, but on top of that, McKinnon also managed to find a document entitled Non Terrestrial Officers. Non Terrestrial Officers? What? What? Is that just fancy to talk for astronaut? Well, the document was a spreadsheet listing the names of NASA officers and employees who were to be transferred to new ships or to serve on board space stations. But here's where it gets weird. McKinnon noted that the names of these vessels listed did not appear to exist in any other database. And if that wasn't enough, McKinnon claims in his searching he saw images of aircraft that did not resemble anything he had ever seen. One in particular he describes as looking like a massive cigar shaped craft floating over the northern hemisphere that did not look man made. One one if that's the same as the Tic Tac ship. He said he was in a shock looking at the image and didn't think to take a photo. Now, after pulling off an unbelievable fast one on NASA, McKinnon couldn't resist a bit of cheeky cyber vandalism and edited NASA's website homepage with a bit of text that read, Your security is crap, by the way. Now, I'm not endorsing hacking a government website, but that's one of the coolest things I've ever read. Now, I don't know how much you know about the United States government. Boy, do they just love it when you prove to them that they have a massive security breach in their most classified data. Presumably, the only thing that kept McKinnon from being strapped to a car battery and thrown into a black van by the men in black was the fact that he lived in Scotland and was kind of hard to get a hold of. He was arrested by UK police and the United States government tried oh, their absolute hardest to have him extradited to the states to be tried for the fullest extent of his crimes. Honestly, I bet it was the note. I bet that's what really pushed them over the edge. McKinnon managed to avoid extradition and was protected by the crown for serving out what would have been a 70 year sentence. But presumably he's not planning any road trips to the states anytime soon and I'm sure NASA has improved their security 
security just a little bit. Kicking us off at number 10, we have the O'Hare International Airport. In November 2006, things started to get a little bit unexplainable for staff at Chicago's O'Hare International Airport. Just as Flight 466 was getting ready to take off for their scheduled flight between Chicago and North Carolina, a United Airlines employee on the tarmac noticed a strange object hovering above gate C-17. As they peered closer, they realized that the object was some sort of vessel, dark gray and metallic in appearance. From 4.15 p.m. during the five minutes that the craft was visible, a total of 12 United employees, as well as a few witnesses from outside the airport, witnessed the saucer-shaped object in flight. Shortly afterwards, witnesses claimed that the craft shot upward, breaking a hole in the clouds, enough so that the United flight staff could see the blue sky through it. The story was quickly picked up by the Chicago Tribune and later made international news. Strangely though, because the UFO wasn't picked up by the airport's radar, the airport officials refused to investigate, claiming that it was merely a weather phenomenon. Next up at number nine, we have the Stephenville sightings. In 2008, the small town of Stephenville, Texas, got a bit of a strange surprise during one particular pleasant evening in January. Mostly known for its dairy farms, Stephenville is located 100 miles southwest of Dallas, and for the most part is a pretty regular town. But on January 8th, dozens of its citizens reported a series of strange white lights above Highway 67. At first, they traveled in a single horizontal arc and then switched to a series of vertical parallel lines. A local pilot, Stephen Allen, reported that the lights spanned about a mile long and half a mile wide. He also estimated that they were traveling about 3,000 miles an hour. Just as a benchmark, the average airliner travels at around 575 miles an hour. On top of this, no sound was reported by any of the townspeople. Weeks later, after the story caught some traction, the US Air Force explained that they were flying F-16s in the area. The townspeople, they didn't buy it. Why? Because F-16s can't fly anywhere close to the speeds that the lights were sighted at. So, who knows? Bringing it in at number eight, we have the USS Nimitz Encounter. For two weeks, the USS Princeton was on a routine assignment, tracking reported objects that would appear at 80,000 feet and then plummet to hover above the Pacific Ocean. What's that, they asked. By November 14th, 2014, the ship had noted an object that appeared 100 miles off the coast of San Diego. After another nearby naval vessel, the USS Nimitz had dispatched two fighter jets to the location, what they first saw appeared to be churning, boiling water in an oval shape underneath the surface. Then, suddenly and out of nowhere, the pilots reported a white tic-tac-like object that appeared above the water. The strange vessel had no visible markings that would indicate an engine, wings, or even a window. The two pilots, Commander David Fravor and Lieutenant Commander Jim Slate, attempted to intercept the craft, but it quickly accelerated away and disappeared. Later, it reappeared on radar 60 miles away. The UFO phone moved at three times the speed of sound and twice the speed of the fighter jets. Scary stuff. Next up at number seven, we have the story of William Bosack. William Bosack was a dairy farmer they always are, from Polk County, Wisconsin, and on December 2nd, 1974, at 10.30 p.m., he stumbled across something that made him question his belief in aliens. Bosak was traveling from a local cooperative when he saw something on the side of the road on the way back to his farm. It was a tall object that was around three meters high and had a dull surface which didn't shine, but strangely reflected the car's headlights. On top of the object was a transparent section which had a creature in it with its hands raised in the air. Bosak reported that the creature was similar to a human being, but its head was covered in hard, short hair with large, bulging eyes and larger ears that resembled a calf's. Its body was covered in a thick brown wool, and it had a terrified facial expression as if it feared for its own life. Bosak couldn't explain what he saw, but as later paranormal reporters found, the town locals considered him to be an honest, truthful man and a general skeptic of UFOs. Since then though, he's changed his tune and has even stood up to a lie detector test to confirm his claims. Coming in at number six, we have paranormal hitchhikers. Strange orbs are a pretty common occurrence in UFO sightings, but this one kind of takes it to a new level. In 2011, an unnamed security officer was driving home on a South Dakota highway. Suddenly, hundreds of opaque red lights began to appear around his vehicle and circled the moving car like a strange 
strange alien halo. The driver reported to police that he was still doing 60 miles an hour, but suddenly the car rapidly began to decelerate with absolutely no explanation. And then the lights, well, they just vanished. The driver later told police that as he was readjusting to what had happened, he noticed the lights re-emerge at the side of the road. It strangely began to assemble itself into some sort of glowing life form. And then without pause, it was on the bonnet of the car. He reported that it had long translucent fingers that stretched through the roof of his car. The creature then ran its fingers down his back, which left a searing, burning pain. However, the officer also reported that he felt as if the creature was trying to communicate with him. As soon as the driver saw headlights in the distance, the creature reportedly dematerialized and disappeared, but the driver was left with some pretty terrifying memories. Jumping on in at number five, we have the story of Gabriel. In Ethiopia, sometime in the 1960s, a young boy by the name of Gabriel was playing in his backyard with a friend. They were running around when Gabriel just kind of disappeared out of thin air. Traumatized, his friend alerted Gabriel's parents and soon enough, the whole town was on lockdown. No one could explain what happened and it remained a complete mystery. That is until six months later when Gabriel rematerialized in a busy market square. Just like that, he was back. Witnesses couldn't begin to explain what they'd just seen. If that's not weird enough, the story that Gabriel later told would leave everyone baffled. He said that seconds after he was playing in the backyard, he was suddenly in a place he didn't recognize. Gabriel was led into a glowing windowless white room by a strange humanoid creature. Inside that room were other abducted children, seemingly from different parts of planet Earth. He said that some of the children had been there for months, but his grasp of time was a little bit off. His captors later led him to a large city-like area with no sky, surrounded by supernatural skyscrapers. He reported seeing flying vehicles that resembled cars, and other humans were walking with creatures that he didn't recognize along streets that almost shone. Gabriel reported that the whole experience lasted a couple of hours, but when he was transported back, he had no idea that six months had just passed. Remember kids, never go off with strangers. Next up at number four, we have the story of Travis Walton. Now, this one is pretty damn weird, so just stick with it. The case begins in November 1975 at the Apache Sitgreaves National Forest near Phoenix, Arizona. Travis Walton was a forestry worker and along with six colleagues, they were on a tree thinning project out in the woods. The seven of them reported at first seeing mysterious lights, which then materialized into some sort of flying saucer up in the canopy. Mesmerized, Walton was the only one to get out of the vehicle and approach the craft, despite his friends yelling at him to get back. Suddenly, Travis was hit by what he referred to as an energy beam and he was blasted back over 20 feet. He disappeared over the trees while his colleagues were still trying to figure out what the hell had just happened. Originally, police thought that this whole thing was an elaborate cover-up by his colleagues and in reality, they'd murdered him and disposed of the body. But everyone lost their minds when Travis turned up five days later, claiming that he'd been abducted by aliens and that he'd had to fight his way out. Travis claimed that three humanoid beings held him captive. They were gray, smooth-skinned, and blemishless. Later, all seven of the group passed lie detector tests, adding credibility to this bizarre ordeal. Coming in at number three, we have the Valentich disappearance. Now, this story is pretty compelling, and whatever the truth really is, some downright weird stuff went on here. At 7.12 p.m. on the 21st of October, 1978, one of the most unexplainable UFO sightings in modern history occurred over the Bass Strait in Australia. Born on the 9th of June, 1958 in Melbourne, Frederick Valenchik was a 20-year-old shop assistant with a passion for aviation. During his 127-mile flight, Fred intended to fly out to King Island, but during his journey, he ran into something a little bit strange. Fred advised Melbourne Air Traffic Control that he was being accompanied by an aircraft that was about 300 meters above him. Air Traffic replied that there was no known traffic at that level. He described the vessel as being long and having some unusual features, illuminated by four bright landing lights and was acting in a very strange way. Visibility was good and winds were light, so Fred quickly ruled out the possibility of an optic illusion. The craft passed him regularly at high speeds before or switching up direction and altitude. Frederick claimed that the aircraft was orbiting above him and after 28 seconds of radio silence, he reported that the vessel had just vanished. But 
Moments later, after telling air traffic he was proceeding to King Island, Frederick notified the operator that the aircraft was back. And in his words, it's hovering and it's not an aircraft. This was followed by 17 seconds of a strange, unidentified noise, described as being metallic, scraping sounds. Then all contact was lost. Frederick Valentich's body was never found and neither was his aircraft. Bringing it in at number two, we have the Aurora, Texas crash. You're not going to believe this one, but seriously, I'm pretty sure this is legit aliens. In 1897, that's right, 1897, six years before the Wright brothers' first flight, numerous sightings of a strange cigar-shaped airship were reported all across the United States. And the small town of Aurora, Texas would quickly become one of the most infamous UFO hotbeds in the world. On April 17th, locals ran out of their houses to the sight of a mysterious object in the sky, and they soon realized that it was about to crash. Slowing down to a speed of 10 or 12 miles, the aircraft gradually settled itself toward the ground, sailing directly over the busy public square and crashing into a windmill in the northern part of the town, which was owned by the town's lawmaker, Judge Proctor. The residents soon rushed over to the crash site, where they found strange burning machinery and the pilot who had not survived the crash. Locals reported that the pilot was not of this world, and in New newspaper reports, they referred to it as a Martian in 1897. There were also a stack of papers found on the body, written in an unknown form of hieroglyphics which couldn't be deciphered. Strangely enough, the townsfolk buried the pilot in the nearby Aurora Cemetery. Yet, yeah, let's stop there. The body is allegedly still somewhere in the local cemetery, buried in an unmarked grave. The cemetery even contains a historical commission marker that mentions the incident. There you have it, there's an alien buried somewhere in Aurora. Texas. And finally, at our number one top spot, we have the Roswell incident. No alien list would be complete without the most infamous and near enough credible UFO landing in history. In July 1947, a strange airborne object crashed on a ranch in Roswell, New Mexico. The big kicker to this story, though, is how the US military reacted to the events that would later unfold. On July 8th, an Air Force public information officer named Walter Holt issued a press release stating that officials have recovered a flying disc from the Roswell crash site. Later that day, the Air Force changed their story, claiming that the flying disc was actually, in fact, a weather balloon. Seems a little bit fishy, right? The incident faded into obscurity for over 30 years, but in 1978, dozens of officials pulled forward, claiming that the whole Roswell incident was a complete cover-up, and that as many as 11 alleged crash sites had been part of a large-scale military operation to contain the truth. In 1989, a former mortician named Glenn Dennis put forward a detailed personal account where he claimed that he'd witnessed multiple alien autopsies carried out at the Roswell base. What this gave birth to was an astronomical rise in UFO popularity, with thousands of people pouring in across the globe with similar stories and experiences. What do you guys think? Have you ever experienced an unexplainable alien incident? Do you believe that we're not alone in the universe? As the old saying goes, the truth is out there. Number five, the Navy pilots. Since the release of the UAP documents, sorry, the new nomenclature, UFO fever has been in the air more than ever since Roswell. We've got open confirmation that the US government, the Pentagon, is researching actively the possibility of alien craft outright. That's the craziest thing that's ever happened in my life. In September 2019, Navy spokesperson Joe Gratisher confirmed that three recently released videos by the military contain evidence of unidentified aerial phenomenon. Like that's it. That's this is the the Navy, the government pointing to a video and going, "Yeah, that's an unidentified flying object that we don't know about." They're not saying it's a weather balloon. They're not saying it's stars. They're not outright saying it's an alien, but they're certainly implying it. The Navy agreed that they would confirm the sightings this time, because pilots encounter bizarre sightings all the time, but are usually too concerned to report the sightings because of the stigma attached to previous theories about what may or may not be in those videos. Put gently, it means that the Navy felt like they had to comment on this thing so that pilots would feel comfortable admitting that maybe they're seeing UFOs without feeling like a tinfoil hat wearing conspiracist. The videos in question include reports from the stars. Academy of Arts and Sciences, released from 2017 to 2018. They feature long, oblong-shaped objects captured with infrared 
red that appear in the Earth's atmosphere before rapidly disappearing from view. Now, really interestingly here is these aren't the only pill-shaped cylindrical UFOs that have been spotted recently. There were two videos from 2015 that came out, and before that, there was a Navy case involving these in 2004. And even on the rest of this list, you'll see a cylindrical cigar-shaped UFO in a sighting from the 40s. So this sort of thing does happen a lot. Now, the purpose of the Navy investigating all this stuff, it's more focused on safety hazard and threats of national security. But hey, at the same time, they may not be willing to talk about it so brazenly, but they definitely are checking just a little bit to make sure they are aliens. But they definitely know more than they're letting on. This footage released only makes up a tiny fraction of what the US Navy and other service branches encounter. One pilot, Lieutenant Graves, claims that in his 10 years flying for the Navy, he thinks he's probably encountered, oh, I don't know, thousands of UFOs in his time. Those are his words. Now, who is to say how many of those might just actually be unidentified flying objects, birds, scouts, drones, whatever? But who's to say how many of them really were alien craft from outside the planet? And my friends, if you're looking to educate yourself on the matter of extraterrestrials, UAPs, UFOs, well, you've got to know by now Top 5 Scary is the place to be. I see the viewer stats in the videos. You goblins love when we talk about aliens. Well, if you want to keep loving them, click on through. We've got more unexplained sightings in the sky than the CIA. And if you want them delivered hot and fresh, you can subscribe and get them before anybody else. Number 4. Child's Witted Case The Child's Witted Encounter is one of the most recognized UFO encounters in American history for how surprisingly credible it seems. It happened shortly after the Roswell incident, when UFO fever was hot, hot on everybody's minds in the states and it was showing. The sighting occurred in the morning hours of one July 24th, 1948. The two pilots, one Clarence Childs and John Witted, were flying approximately 5,000 feet above Montgomery, Alabama on a clear normal night. Flight was going well, nothing too exciting, but at around 2.45 in the morning, Childs saw something peculiar. He noticed a dull red glowing light above and ahead of the aircraft, and it wasn't even remotely near Christmas, so it wasn't Rudolph leading the sleigh. He told Witted that it must be a new type of army jet that was flying in front of them that neither of them had ever seen. They wanted to get a better look at it, and in a matter of seconds, well, they would. When the object flew past the right side of their plane and pulled up with a tremendous burst of flame protruding from its rear, and it zoomed upwards and onwards into the clouds. The two pilots described the object looking like a flying cigar with a cylindrical chassis and two decks and windows. Besides the two pilots, one passenger on the flight, one C.L. McKelvey, insisted that during his flight, he saw a bright streak of red flashing lights by one of his windows. Now, Childs and Witted were obviously pretty darn confused by whatever it was they'd saw, didn't look like no plane they'd seen before, and the way it moved seemed technologically more advanced than anything the US Army was putting out in the late 40s. Now, the US Army proper would challenge this account, and their scientists insisted they investigated the report and said that it was probably just a meteor the pilots and passengers had seen, which almost sounds like it might make sense until you stop and think about it for a second, because what meteor has windows and a glowing red light coming from it and propels itself forward and rapidly goes upward. Most meteors I've ever heard of go downwards. And Childs and Witted both disagreed with this as well, saying they got a good long look at it and it wasn't a meteor. Whatever it truly was though, might be lost to history. Tragically. Number 3. The Gander Newfoundland in Cantor Our next story comes to us from Gander Newfoundland, and it happened on February 10, 1951. A U.S. Naval Reserve Lieutenant and pilot Graham Bethune was occupying the captain's seat of a plane flying near Newfoundland, Canada, when he spotted something unusual, massive, and rapidly approaching towards the plane. It resembled a disc. The co-pilot made a report of what he saw, and this is what he wrote. Take a listen. I observed a glow of light below the horizon about 1,000 to 15 100 feet above the water. The pilot and I observed its course and motion for about four or five minutes before calling it to the attention of the other crew members. Suddenly, the object changed direction at an incredible speed and began to pulsate, changing its colors as well. Then, it somehow reversed its course and tripled its speed until at last, it disappeared over the horizon. The report would go on to say that whatever this object was, it came within five miles of the aircraft, which was proven later by radar evidence. Now, when the plane had landed, the entire crew was detained by intelligence officers and interrogated. At their destination, pilot and passengers were questioned again by naval intelligence and required to sign full disclosure documents. Now, take this next part with a grain of salt. Okay, because I only found one source on this. But apparently a CIA scientist confidentially interviewed the pilot and during their interrogation, he showed him a photo of a disc-like object that looked extremely similar to the one they had seen flying over the Atlantic. 
However, during the interviews, no Navy, Air Force, or CIA men would ever answer any questions related to extraterrestrials. No one would say the word alien. No one was saying UFO. Nothing like that. They were trying very hard to downplay that. So what was it then? Because it sounds incredibly suspicious that the interviewers had a photo of something that looked similar to it and weren't saying the word alien at all. Number 2. November 1986 Japanese Airlines Flight Our next one comes to us from a pair of Japanese pilots in November 1986. Japanese Airlines Flight 1628 was heading over Alaska. Captain Kenju Tarauchi and a crew of two others were on a flight making routine cargo deliveries to France. Captain Tarauchi saw something that caught his attention when he saw blinding lights flashing off at the left and the right of the plane. Now, initially he didn't think too much of it. He thought, hey, maybe these are just US fighter jets zipping around. As his plane furthered forward, he realized that the object was flying ahead of him was of the unidentified variety, a UFO, if you will. Tarachi said that it looked like two spaceships had stopped in front of their faces, shooting off lights. The inside cockpit shined brightly, and I felt warm in the face. He wrote. That almost sounds kind of pleasant, to be honest. Captain Tarauchi described the objects as being cuboid shaped spaceships with a jet propulsion system that had horizontal lines of circular exhausts clustered around a dark center. The captain had also reported that when the plane had flown by this object, ground communications were cut out and all radar was blocked. Well, that's kind of odd, isn't it? Pretty interesting. Well, if you thought that was weird, the FAA would agree with you. That's the Federal Aviation Administration who investigated the report very closely. Into interrogating Tarauchi for everything they could out of the incident. Now during this questioning, his co-pilot and his flight engineer, they said that they thought the object they saw was just strange lights, but they did agree that they really couldn't easily explain what it was they saw. In the end, the FAA ruled that what it was was light refraction through ice crystals suspended in clouds, a bunch of science words, sure. Number 1. Lieutenant Gorman our number one spot on this list is a humdinger of a tale. Now most of us can only hope to maybe someday see a UFO in our lives. But I mean maybe if you were like me and you watched Star Wars way too many times and you still ask the hairdressers to get your hair cut like Luke Skywalker, not like anybody I know. Maybe you dream of flying an X-Wing through the stars, dodging lasers, getting into a cool alien dogfight. It's a shame none of us can claim we've done that except, you know, George Gorman of the North Dakota National Guard. I don't think anyone would expect there to be anything exciting happening in North Dakota but one of the best UFO encounters in American history did. Let's take a little listen and learn about it. It was 1948, a year after the New Mexico Roswell incident, while people were still hyper focused on little gray men and flying saucers. Lieutenant Gorman was flying a fighter jet solo around the skies above Fargo when he saw what he thought was an aircraft around 500 feet below him. He radioed his tower, but the operator told him that there weren't any other planes to be around and that it was a suspicious vehicle. So Gorman told the tower back he was going to investigate the situation and flew in within a thousand yards to try and positively ID the subject. Gorman said, It looked to be about six to eight inches, clear white and completely round without fuzz at the edges, and it was blinking on and off. As I approached, the light suddenly became steady and pulled into a sharp left bank. I thought it was making a pass at the tower. Gorman then said he thought the light charged at him. He didn't want to be the first pilot to crash into a UFO, so he readied himself to avoid it, but found the object suddenly shot straight upwards in the air, directly above him, and then disappeared into the clouds. Gorman tried his best to pull up to follow along, but his plane went into a stall while he was trailing it and the entity had vanished. Back at the air tower, two traffic controllers reported they also saw a light flying above the airstrip they couldn't explain and weren't present on any flight logs. Gorman was questioned about what he saw and he said he was convinced that it wasn't just a light, that it moved too naturally, that it moved like it was reacting to his movements, as if it was playing a game with him. He said there was thought and precision behind all its maneuvers. We should ask it what it thought about all of that if Gorman was moving too naturally reacting to all of that. Number 5. Hypnotic Regression Many people who claim to have been abducted by aliens are unable to remember a lot of the specific details of their abductions. Because of this and the public stigma against people with alien experiences, many people choose to never come forward, or their stories are written off as delusion. But in the spirit of giving people the benefit of the doubt, let's talk about a certain woman's experience with hypnotic regression. A woman who claims she was abducted by aliens was put under hypnosis in order to give a documentary crew information information about the visitors from other worlds. When asked how aliens are able to travel at such incredible speeds, she responded with the following, I can't explain it, but it's like if they want to get from one point to another point, they remove what's in between, so they don't have to travel that distance. They are instantly from there to there. 
When asked why aliens are studying humans, the response was, they are very wary of humankind. Mankind is progressing technology-wise, and soon he's going to come across technology that will allow him to peel back the layers of dimensions. And they want to know all about man for their own benefit. Man's warlike, aggressive, an animal. He's in possession of technology that is more than he is. There's no balance, and they're very wary that he's now on the threshold of many breakthroughs, one of which is peeling back dimensions. It's like an onion skin. You peel back one layer, and there's another one underneath, and another one underneath, and another one underneath. The same with dimensions. They're scared. Do aliens really study humanity out of a fear of what we will do once we discover interdimensional travel? And if so, how do they feel about all the UFOs we have apparently shot down? What do species historically do with groups that they are afraid of? What fate awaits the human race at the hands of these interplanetary visitors? Number 4. Sam the Sandown Clown our next story comes from the January-February edition of the British UFO Research Association Journal and concerns an anonymous man going by the alias of Mr. Y, who claims that one October night in the year 1970, he was driving to visit a friend when he saw something hovering over the swamp to his right. It was a huge UFO with several different multicolored orb-like lights brightly illuminating the craft. He got out of his vehicle to observe the craft for a moment and then continued on his way. He looked out his window and realized that the craft was now following him, its lights spinning. Mr. Y got to his friend's house, and the friend was amazed at the guests that had followed him there before disappearing into a nearby tree line. For years, Mr. Y would see the red orbs following him from time to time, watching him and stalking him. Doubting that anyone would believe him, he kept these encounters to himself until 1973, when his seven-year-old daughter Faye and her friend were playing near Lake Common Road when they heard an eerie wailing sound. They followed the sound to a nearby meadow, and the wailing stopped. They walked over a small bridge when suddenly a blue gloved hand with three fingers appeared from under the bridge. They looked in the small river and saw a strange figure standing in the middle holding a book. He was described as being seven feet tall and without a neck. He was wearing an odd and tattered costume consisting of a green tunic with a red collar, white pants, and a pointed hat with a black ball on top and two antenna. He had a pale white face, lips that never moved, red hair, and triangle holes for eyes. The children watched in shock as the figure hobbled over to a strange metal hut. Not long after, they saw the figure again as he wailed, and then spoke into a microphone asking if they were still there. He then communicated by writing in his book, saying that his name was Sam. They asked if he was a man, and he said no. They asked if he was a ghost, and he said, well, not really, but in a way, I am. He said that there were others like him and that he was afraid of being attacked by humans. He invited them into his metal hut, which was filled with wooden furniture and elaborate knobs. The children hung out with Sam for an hour before leaving, and a year later, she told her father about the encounter, telling him that there had been men nearby fixing a post who had acted as though they could not see the strange creature. He had trouble believing her, but he had had enough experiences with aliens of his own that he had to consider the possibility that it was real. Did Mr. Wise's daughter really see a strange alien in the woods, or is this just the overactive imagination of a child? In an age where spacecraft are being seen all over the world at an alarming rate, we really can't rule anything out. And what of the UFO stalking Mr. Y? What were they hoping to see? And why was he selected to be the subject of their curiosity? This mystery will likely never be fully unraveled. Number 3. Aliens Take a Baby Our next entry comes courtesy of phantomsandmonsters.com and describes a 14-year-old visiting the home of some seniors and seeing something more terrifying than they could possibly imagine. As they themselves told it, I witnessed an alien abduction back in 2002 when I was 14. A friend of mine wanted me to help her grandparents set up their computer. I said sure and rode my bicycle to their house. I got there and clouds appeared, so I decided to make this a pretty quick visit. I set up the computer and installed some software for them, showing them all how it works and such. They go back and sit on the couch while I get my backpack to get ready to leave, as their other granddaughter, who is about six years old, was sleeping in the other room. All of a sudden, a cold breeze went through the room, 
It was odd, as all the doors and windows were shut. The grandparents looked towards the kitchen, and what I saw made me freeze in place. There were three creatures standing in the kitchen. Two of them were short, grey, alien creatures, with thicker necks than usually described, with the eyes closer to the sides of their heads. They wore silver jumpsuits. In between them was a taller creature that looked like a humanoid mantis, wearing a black robe with a yellow stripe going down the middle. They walked to another room, and a minute later returned with the robed creature, carrying the granddaughter in its arms. It's looking at me, and I get the feeling it knows who I am. I don't know why. I got the feeling, but I did. I was very scared. The grandparents were looking at them too, but not doing anything. I thought, screw this, and fought off all the fear I could and clumsily charged towards them. I didn't even make three steps before the grandfather stopped me and told me they will bring her back. The creatures didn't move and continued to look at me. I couldn't get any more words out of my throat because I didn't even know what to think at this point. All of a sudden, a light stretched around them and they vanished. An odd glow remained for a few seconds before fading. After a minute of awkward silence and the grandfather repeating, she will be brought back, soon I decided to leave. I rode my bicycle home as fast as I could while looking back, hoping that nothing was following me. I didn't sleep that night after I got home. The next day, I told my friend what had happened, and she told me it has happened before. The grandparents and other family members have tried to stop it, but to no avail. They just accepted it with a look of defeat and moved on. The granddaughter was brought back after a few hours. Not long after I witnessed this incident, their whole family moved elsewhere. I've heard from other people who claimed to experience similar events, and I feel they are legit. Why are aliens taking babies away from their families? What are they hoping to learn? And is there some way to stop them? One can hope, but it seems unlikely. Number two, dream or abduction. This next story is from an anonymous Reddit user who claimed to be abducted and experimented on by aliens before waking up at home with injuries related to the experiment. As he told the story, In July of 2015, back when I was 19, I lived in a house in Southport, Sacramento with three other friends. I woke up one night to a light coming through the ceiling of my room, and it lifted me out of my bed. Next thing I know, I'm in some kind of chair and unable to control my body like I was drugged with something. There were guys that were not human men, but grey people with large black almond-shaped eyes doing stuff with what seemed like medical instruments and machines. I was very terrified. I was unarmed, naked, unable to move. I was so scared. One of them was touching the machine that put the tube down my throat and into my stomach. His hand got close to my face because he had to adjust something holding my head in place. I remember getting a good look at his hand and eyes. They had long fingers with pads at the tips, sort of like salamanders, and they don't have fingernails. Their skin is grey, but kind of like a powdery translucent grey. They had large heads with small necks, so small and thin it didn't make sense. Their arms and fingers were long and skinny too. I was in the chair with my head and jaw held by something so I didn't see their feet. I'd say the tallest probably stood about the height of my lowest rib, and for reference, I'm 5'10". The tube machine sucked out the food I ate earlier that day, and then was pulled out of me. I don't remember how I got there, but then I remembered being in a cage made of some kind of metal that reminded me of aluminum. In a room with curved walls, in front of me was a man who looked a lot like a human, talking to a grey person on a window that lit up a screen like a hologram. The man was tall and looked like a human, except that his skin was very white and his hair was blonde and platinum. He spoke with a grey person on the hollow screen in a language I didn't understand. He wore a blue flight uniform of some kind. This man was obviously military of some sort, judging by his uniform. The grey person spoke in a language that sounded like birds chirping. Once the call was over, the hollow screen turned into a different display with symbols, and the man turned and walked to me. He crouched down and spoke to me in plain English and said to me, everything's gonna be fine. I'm going to get you out of here and take you home. I was so happy to hear that. He opened the cage, and next thing I know, I fell on top of my bed with my back hitting the mattress first. I immediately got out of bed right after I fell. Was this a real alien abduction or simply a horrible nightmare? Typically, I would think it was merely a bad dream, but the user describes extreme pain in his throat for days afterwards from the tube being forced into him. What was the source of this pain if it was simply a dream? Truly a strange encounter to contemplate. Number 1. The Alien and the Bassinet our final story is another from phantomsandmonsters.com about a woman who was asleep in bed next to her baby's bassinet before waking up and seeing something that would make any mother panic. The following is an excerpt from her account. I turned over on my side, facing the bassinet, and noticed a bright light coming in between the window blinds. I thought out loud, is it morning already? The light was coming in between the blinds, and it was so bright, but the rest of the room was dark. There was also a bright light on the wall next to the window, and I looked up to see where the light was coming from. To my horror, just above the bassinet was an alien's gray 
face. It was just the head, no upper body, legs, or arms. The head was dark in color, very round, ending in a pointed chin, and there was a small slit for a mouth. The nostrils were small, but the eyes were large and almond-shaped and very shiny black. It had some sort of glass lamp on the top of its head. The light on the wall was projected from the lamp. Then I noticed that the being was looking down at my baby daughter. Oh my god, I couldn't speak. My heart started pounding so hard that I started trembling uncontrollably. It saw me and realized I was looking at it. The being moved towards me and I started screaming and swinging my arms. I remember that I screamed out loud for it to leave. It floated from its original position above the bassinet to just above my face. I remember seeing this light blue fog build up in front of my face and then in a dreamlike manner I heard a cooing sound similar to morning doves. I had the feeling that whoever was talking to me was stern and was telling me that it was for our own good. The woman then describes waking up with a sore spot on her head and the alien being gone without a trace. She insists it was not a dream and that she really saw an alien creature that she believes will one day return. For her sake, let us hope it was simply a dream. I'm just gonna call this first sighting or series of sightings February 2023. February was quite a month for unidentified flying objects and I wanted to start this list off with these sightings because of, of how recent they are. They may not be as definitive or weird as some of the other sightings on this list but uh, these were pretty high profile stories and it's always far more interesting when the government is involved in these things just adds another layer of credibility to it. Not that the, the government doesn't lie or withhold information about things. I think we all know that that happens. Happens, but the fact that it's being reported on so heavily means uh, it's pretty big news. So the story here is that several mysterious high altitude objects were shot down in February of 2023 over various air spaces. We had objects being spotted in, in Canada, United States, Latin America, China, Eastern Europe. It started when several unidentified objects were shot down over Alaska, the Yukon, and Lake Huron. The general of NORAD, Glenn D. Van Herc, made a statement saying the objects could be benign, but it wasn't wasn't a hundred percent sure. When asked if they could be of alien origin, though, that's the question we're all digging to ask, he said. He just wasn't ruling anything out. I'm just interested by this. It really seems like the government and military agencies are starting to become more open to the idea of extraterrestrial life, or maybe some of them already are fully aware of their presence. Either way though, it seems like it's it's being discussed more. It's not being written off as, as nonsense like it has been in the past. So just that aspect alone is interesting to me. Now, here's another interesting thing about these cases. They were recovered attempts made, you know, to find these objects that had plummeted towards the Earth. Unfortunately, they all landed in areas that aren't all that accessible, so it made for a pretty difficult recovery process, and the missions were pretty soon abandoned. Now, that's what they say, but what if the government actually did recover something that they just aren't ready or even willing to show us? Could, could be the case. You never know. Next up, we have the Oumuamua. Oumuamua, that's a hard word to say. I'm gonna try not to say it too many times on here. Old news with this one, right? It's that weird cylindrical um, object that was spotted flying through space. It's definitely been talked about plenty of times, including on this channel, I'm sure, but it's a recent article dated March 7th of this year that I'm referring to here. So, like I said before, I think when the government, military, or academics get involved with UFO type stories, it just makes it far more interesting to me. Not that I'd, I'd totally disregard some farmer in Ohio saying he was probed by a little gray bug-eyed alien, but I don't know. Pe people like attention sometimes. In a recent article written by Sean Kirkpatrick, head of the Pentagon's AARO, or All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, which specializes in unidentified flying objects, and a Harvard professor named Avi Loeb, they uh, discussed the possibility that objects such as as a muamua spotted back in 2017 could be of alien origin. So uh, pretty exciting. I mean, these are two learned, intelligent people writing an official document theorizing the possibility of alien life. I mean, that's just that's just cool. The article does say, however, that the objects like the muamua could be quote a parent craft that releases many small probes during its close passage to Earth. So probes observing Earth could be good or bad or, or neutral, depending on whether you're a glass half empty or 
half full type person. Now they didn't just discuss that uh, object, they were looking at a variety of unidentified objects or, or probes and they went on to speculate that these crafts could potentially power their batteries from starlights and that maybe Earth's water could be fuel. It's pretty wild stuff and yes a lot of it is speculative but the fact that a highly respected scientist that spent you know 20 years studying physics is proposing these ideas, pretty fascinating. Something I also want to mention about people who are just very skeptical about aliens even showing any interest at all in Earth. You know, you'll hear them say stuff like, well, extraterrestrial beings with all this advanced technology, they just wouldn't be interested in anything we're doing. It'd be like, you know, God observing ants or something. And who's to say, first of all, that God doesn't like observing ants? And, you know, even if that is the case, I mean, like, how, how can you really know that for sure? How on Earth could we possibly know what beings from another planet are interested in? We don't know what kind of hobbies they have. It's also kind of kind of counters their other argument because it's like, yeah, space-faring extraterrestrials would be leagues ahead of us in terms of intelligence, but I know what they're thinking. I know what they like. I don't know. Just doesn't make any sense. The Texas Zoo creature. So we take a look at a lot of UFOs on this channel. So I thought I'd change it up a bit and take a look at a bizarre looking creature instead. This picture was taken just one year ago, back in May of 2022. It was taken by a security camera at a zoo in Amarillo, Texas at around 1.30 a.m. A bizarre figure was spotted on a security camera. And before you say it's just a lion on its hind legs, which would also be pretty freaky mind you. This figure was outside of the zoo, so it's not one of the animals unless one of them escaped. Now, why am I putting this on an alien list? A lot of people think it looks like a, a werewolf or Sonic the Hedgehog or something, but I don't know. To me, it looks pretty alien. Look at the elongated back part of the head. It almost looks like a xenomorph from Alien or something. Plus, I find the presence of alien life to be far, far more likely than werewolves or other kinds of fantasy-based creatures like that. I mean, like, who knows, but there's a lot of unexplored space out there and a lot of explored space here on Earth. I think we'd have spotted a werewolf by now if they existed. There's also a big chance that this could just be a trick of the camera. Security footage can be kind of janky sometimes, or perhaps we have a zoo prankster on our hands, or maybe this is a super deformed person. If that's the case, I hope they're okay. Regardless though, this is an odd figure to see in the middle of the night outside of a Texas zoo. And trust me, I know my Texas zoos. The whales UFO. I didn't know this, but it turns out there are a lot of UFO sightings in whales. I don't know what the aliens fascination is with whales, but reports date all the way back to the 1940s, actually all the way back to the 12th century, but I don't know if I give much credence to stuff dating back that far. Apparently religious pilgrims believed to have seen a fire-breathing dragon erupt from the sea and fly into the sky. Could have been a UFO and they just didn't know what to make of it and just called it a dragon, but anyway, way off topic. The UFO in question here was spotted back in September of 2016 by a police helicopter at around 9 p.m. It was only visible on the chopper's thermal camera and seemed to be moving at a speed of 106 miles per hour over the Bristol Channel. Full video of the footage was released by a former cop, Gary Hasseltine, who has been urging the UK government to come forward and reveal what they know about UFOs. What's also interesting about this one is that the object was moving against the wind. So it is or was being operated one way or another. It's not like it was some object caught up in a wind current or something. Police also stated years after the event that it could have possibly been a drone, but they were struggling to keep up with it. So it'd have to be a pretty fast one. There are drones that reach that 100 mile per hour speed, but they're pretty high end. Your common drones clock in at around 45 to 70 miles per hour. So and again, who knows, but it's possible. And coming in at our number one spot, we have aliens in Bolivia. I wanted to finish off with this one because we have reports of both your typical UFO sighting and reports of actual aliens being spotted here. So we're getting some real bang for your buck with this one. The story just happened back in March of this year and it all started when residents of a small village in the La Paz area of Bolivia claimed to have spotted a mysterious green light in the sky. A bunch of people pulled out their phones and started filming. They were in absolute awe. 
and said it looked to be some kind of alien spacecraft. Then two days later, little people were spotted running around the town at night. One villager named Rita Marquez reported to news outlets describing the creatures as little, almost like goblins, and is quoted saying they were miniature beings, like those little people who appear to children. And it felt like something creepy was happening, like they were welcoming their friends, you know? Now, I'm not sure exactly what she means by that, but it's definitely odd. This bizarre situation all culminated with several residents claiming to have found one of the small creatures curled up dead in a gutter one morning, the body of which soon vanished. So, we clearly have a lot going on here. Weird lights in the sky, possibly even an aircraft spotted, little beings running around the streets at night, a dead one, unfortunately. It's all pretty weird, and sure, it's possible it's just a hoax or even maybe mass hysteria, but there's also a good chance that it isn't. I love stories like this where there are multiple witnesses. Again, it adds another layer of credibility to the whole thing because obviously it's a lot harder to organize a hoax and get multiple people involved. People talk, you know, they, they let secrets out. Another interesting thing about this one is that authorities did get involved and told the villagers to kind of stay hushed about the whole incident, so maybe they just thought everyone uh, was nuts and didn't want to spread misinformation, but perhaps there is something going on here that they need to cover up for one reason or another. Either way though, something happened. Are they among us? We may soon find out. Starting at number 5 is the abduction of Frederick Valentich. It all began on the evening of October 21st, 1978. The 20 year old Australian pilot took off from Moorabbin Airport in Melbourne, embarking on a routine flight in a single engine Cessna 182L, a plane he's flown countless times in the past. Frederick departed for a training flight to King Island over the Bass Strait between the Australian mainland and Tasmania. However, what began as an ordinary flight soon turned into a a bone chilling encounter with the unknown. As Valentik flew over the Bass Strait, he reported to air traffic control that an unidentified aircraft was following him. He fearfully described the object as having four bright lights and flying at unfathomable speeds. Air traffic control attempted to identify the mysterious craft, but could find no evidence of any other aircraft in the vicinity. The situation took a grim turn when Valentik's communication became increasingly distressed, and he reported that the unidentified craft was orbiting him from above. He described the UFO's appearance as metallic and shiny, and praised its maneuverability. It was then that his communications would abruptly cut, with the last thing heard from him being, it's not an aircraft. Just before the communications were cut off, a loud metallic scraping was heard from Frederick's radio. Neither him nor his aircraft were ever seen again. Speculation around Valentik's disappearance quickly spread, with theories ranging from mundane explanations such as pilot error, mechanical failure, or deliberate disappearance, to the more sensational ones involving extraterrestrial encounters. Based on the information we have, all signs point to Frederick being abducted by some sort of malevolent aliens. The reported scraping noise heard before his communications were cut, likely the sounds of the pilot's aircraft being stuffed into a UFO. The the true fate of Frederick Valentik remains a mystery, but the Australian government has assumed him dead after spending many long hours searching for the missing pilot. Where do you think he might be? Let us know in the comments. Moving on, we have number 4, Travis Walton. One fateful night, November 5th, 1975. The Apache Sitgreaves National Forest in Arizona, USA. Travis Walton, a 22 year old logger and his crew were returning home after a long day of hard work when they noticed some sort of metallic glowing disc in the sky. Curious to see what it was, Walton and crew drove closer to the flying object. Once they got close enough to investigate, the forestry worker left the car to get a closer look and approached the hovering craft. Witness accounts vary on exactly what transpired, but the consistent chilling detail was that a bright blue green beam of light suddenly emanated from the UFO, striking Travis and sending him flying several feet backwards, knocking him unconscious. Seeing this, his crew immediately fled the scene, assuming the blast of light killed Walton, leaving him behind. And before you go in the comments calling Walton's friends fake, don't worry, they returned a few minutes later only to find that both Travis and the UFO had vanished. The crew was quick to report the incident to the local authorities, and a massive search operation was launched to find Travis Walton. No matter how hard anyone looked, nobody could find him. That was until five days later. Travis would reappear, disoriented and confused, 
in Heber, Arizona, nearly 30 miles away from the original abduction site. But the story he had to tell of the intervening days is the truly chilling part of this tale. According to Travis, after being struck by the beam of light, he awoke aboard an alien spacecraft. He described encountering beings he could only describe as humanoid but with large bald heads and enormous black wraparound eyes. He reported undergoing a grueling medical examinations and being surrounded by strange technology aboard the craft. During his captivity, Travis experienced some form of telepathic communication with the beings, claiming that they conveyed a sense of curiosity and concern, as if they were studying him. Despite all of this, Travis said that he never felt physically harmed by the entities. After what seemed like mere hours to Travis, he found himself back on Earth, disoriented and unsure of where he was and unaware of how much time had elapsed. Travis Walton's encounter with aliens remains one of the most infamous abduction stories of all time, and has certainly earned its place on this list. Oh, next up at number 3 is the many abductions of Russ Kellett. And yes, that's right, you heard many. In fact, Russ Kellett, a 58 year old man from North Yorkshire, claims he's been abducted up upwards of 60 times, and those are just the ones he remembers. The first time Kellett was abducted was when he was 16, when he was traveling home on his motorcycle until he saw a strange tunnel that he'd never seen before. Curious, he drove through the tunnel being faced with a bright light, and then the next thing he remembers is lying down on an operating table, surrounded by 15 feet tall alien men. He related their appearance to Dracula, minus the fangs. Kellett reported that the Dracula doppelgangers pushed a tube down his throat and pumped a mysterious liquid into him. He claims made him a super soldier. He recalls checkered rooms and special glass orbs used to control the navigation of spaceships, and has made several sketches of the parts of his abductions he remembers. Ever since that first abduction, Russ would battle in a multitude of intergalactic wars and conflicts, so he claims, having fought all sorts of different aliens such as one race of aliens called the Dragos, which are tall and scaly and have dragon like heads. After the aliens are satisfied with his work, they wipe his memory and send him back to Earth. These missions would vary in length, between lasting for days to lasting for years. However, from the perspective of us on Earth, he is only gone for hours at a time. His explanation for this was that time moves differently on the planets he's sent to fight on, where a day on one planet could be mere seconds on Earth. Skeptics were quick to dismiss Russ's accounts of his second life as an alien super soldier, but he claims he has proof. Last year, Russ was able to capture footage of what he says are several UFOs, the same ones that have been abducting him and taking him to the corners of space to fight space wars. Whether or not his outlandish story is true is for you to decide, but me personally, I'm not signing up to be drafted for any intergalactic wars. Moving on to number 2 is the most iconic abduction story of all time, the Barney and Betty Hill incident. The Barney and Betty Hill incident? which occurred on the evening of September 19, 1961, is one of the earliest and most influential cases of alien abduction in UFO history. The Hills, a married couple from New Hampshire, were driving home from a vacation in Canada. As they drove through the White Mountains of New Hampshire, Barney noticed a bright light in the sky that appeared to be following the couple everywhere they went. Out of concern, Barney pulled over to get a better look of the object through binoculars, and to their astonishment, they saw what appeared to be a disc-shaped craft with multicolored lights hovering in the sky. Unsettled, the Hills hastily re-entered their car and started driving again, with the mysterious craft still in pursuit. As they continued their journey, the Hills noticed something strange, that there were two hours that had passed that were completely unaccounted for. Over the following days, Barney and Betty began experiencing anxiety, bizarre dreams, and inexplicable memories of the encounter. In hopes of finding answers, the couple consulted with a local psychiatrist who used hypnosis to uncover buried memories of the event. Once under hypnosis, the Hills were able to recall the terrifying events that transpired in those lost two hours. They described being taken aboard the vessel and seeing these short aliens with grayish skin, large black eyes, and slits for mouths. Barney and Betty recounted being subjected to intense medical examinations, including the extraction of bodily fluids and having organs observed. They would go on to detail their feelings of fear and helplessness during the encounter too, saying that they felt like they were going to die. A great reminder of why we use anesthesia before performing surgeries, guys. After the media picked up their story, the Hills' lives changed dramatically. They faced both support and skepticism from the public, and their story ignited a broader fascination with UFOs and extraterrestrial life worldwide. Despite the enduring controversy surrounding their account, the Hills remained steadfast in their belief that they had indeed encountered beings from another world. Until their passing, they maintained their version of events, and their story has become a touchstone for anyone interested in investigating. UFO abductions. What do you guys think? The story is just a hoax 
or has it got some credibility? Comment below your thoughts and let me know. Finishing off at number one is the Berkshire County incident on the night of September 1st, 1969 in Berkshire County, Massachusetts. Multiple witnesses reported a series of UFO sightings and encounters. Residents all over the town recount seeing a UFO flying above and around Berkshire County, with statements remaining consistent with one another, making this one of the most plausible UFO abduction stories of all time. The most significant incident relating to this UFO involved two separate families who claimed to have experienced a close encounter with the unidentified identified craft. According to the witnesses' accounts, around 9 p.m., Tom Reed, a nine-year-old boy, was driving through the woods with his mother, grandmother, and younger brother. Suddenly, they would see a bright object descending from the sky. In response, Tom's mother stopped the car and they watched the object, which was about 40 feet in diameter, hover above the ground. Then, the next thing the family remembered was being in a different location entirely. They claimed that they were now about a mile down the road and the UFO was gone. The family would go on to report that in the following years, they experienced recurring nightmares and strange encounters, suggesting possible ongoing contact with the extraterrestrial entities. Other families in the town reported similar occurrences and UFO sightings around the same time. Over the years, the incident gained attention and underwent various investigations by UFO researchers and enthusiasts. Many try to explain the strange event as natural phenomena or mass misidentification, but the fact that so many people reported the same thing, it's hard not to believe them. This is the first time an entire town has been affected by alien intervention at the same time and remains the most frightening cases of abduction due to its sheer scale alone. Number five, strange things in the skies. Now, I know I talked about this in a previous video, and if you're a really good top five scary fan, maybe you'll recognize some of these. But since I aired that last video, way more weird stuff has happened. So it only seems fitting that we'd run through it once again. Starting on February 10th, yours truly's birthday, by the way, there was a pattern of incredibly bizarre happenings in the skies and some very, very dodgy answers from government officials who refused to confirm or deny anything, which always seems more suspicious than less. So here's a quick Coles Notes play-by-play -play of the last few weeks. On February 10th, U.S. fighter jets brought down a still unidentified object over the coast of Alaska. Now, this object has not been confirmed what it is at all or identified, but it's been confirmed as not being a balloon. Okay, that's one thing, only a million left to go. One official referred to it as being the size of a small car, which is definitely beyond strange. You think you would see that flying around? This single event would probably be enough to set tinfoil hats on fire and keep me in business for the next few years making videos about conspiracies, but the literal next day on February 11th, a UFO was shot down over Canada around the Yukon. That's the big territory up on the left, right by Alaska. A US fighter jet downed this one, and it was described as being smaller than the first and cylindrical in nature, which is gonna come up a few times before this video is done, so hold on to that thought, there's still more. February 12th, we had something bizarre shot down over Lake Huron, an object that first appeared over Montana, reappeared on Sunday, before being shot down, with an octagonal structure and strings hanging off of it, but it wasn't carrying anything, which is bizarre. And then over Billings, Montana, there was something very bizarre that was seen falling from the sky, leaving a thick orange chemtrail, and residents were left in the dark about it. Local residents wondered just what it was, and some Redditors in a group noticed around the area that there had been an increased military presence since the sighting. So just what is going on around here? there and just about everywhere. But if you can't wait at all and you just want to watch alien videos all day, I agree with you. That's what I do every single day and it's a great way to live. We've got loads of alien and UFO vids, NASA conspiracies, all the things they don't want you to know. And if that ain't your jam, we got scary stories, horror movies, monsters, cryptids, true crime, just about everything spooky under the sun and above it. So stay subscribed to Top 5 Scary, but most importantly, stay scared. And keep watching this video because I got way more weird stuff coming up for you. Number four, the Tom DeLonge sighting. If you're a UFO enthusiast, then you know that one of the leading names in UFO research and discovery right now is Tom DeLonge, the nasally voiced frontman for pop punk project Blink-182. And if you didn't know that, now you do. Although I suspect most of the people who watch our videos don't know that band. Anyway, little trivia for you. That's what he does when he's not selling out $300 concerts. He hunts aliens and he's pretty good at it. If some of the footage he gathers is anything to go by, why don't you take a look at this weird footage he shared on his Instagram a couple days ago. It's gonna go right there.
pretty darn weird, huh? If that isn't one of the most clear, close encounters I've ever seen, I'm not sure what is. You can practically like trace the outline of the flying saucer. It looks like the platonic flying saucer, like the, the one we all imagine when we close our eyes. I can almost see the little green man inside. On his Instagram, DeLong wrote this caption, enjoy. They are real. To the Stars Media will be turning real events like these into major feature films and television series to bring the facts to the world. Note the whirling sound from the propulsion. Now, To the Stars is the fringe research company owned by Tom DeLonge, hoping to spread information and explore the possibility of UFOs and UAPs and it does also sound like it's a plan to get Tom DeLonge some more money by making a cinematic alien universe. Whatever his end game is though, can't deny the footage posted here is eerily compelling. Number three, Gary McKinnon. Now I've talked a bit about Gary McKinnon before on this channel because I am obsessed with this story. He's a notorious hacker who broke into NASA's security. His story is a cool one. I love anytime you hear someone pulling a fast one over a government agency like this, so it bears repeating. He's a genius computer hacker with a lot of spare time and wanted to know just what the Yanks were hiding from his home in Scotland. He wanted to go after NASA's data server to see if they had anything hidden they'd never told anybody about. Been called the biggest military hack of all time, so I'd wager maybe he found something. Why risk your life, career, freedom on this exactly? McKinnon claims he had received an insider tip that the US had reverse engineered technology from UFOs, free energy. In his own words, he said, this should not be kept hidden from the public when pensioners can't even pay their fuel bills. And it's just like a bonus if you get some alien stuff on the side. So what did he find? McKinnon claims in his searching, he saw images of aircraft that did not resemble any he had ever seen in his life. One in particular, he describes as looking like a massive cigar shaped craft floating over the northern hemisphere that did not look man made. He said he was in shock looking at the image and didn't think to take a photo. Well, there's those cylindrical shaped crafts again. I told you to th keep thinking about them and keep thinking about them again because they're gonna show up one more time before this video is done. Well, that wasn't the only exciting thing he found. He also found something called the Disclosure Project, a 400 page document outlining testimonials from government agents across multiple branches of service recording sightings of unidentified objects, but that wasn't even the meal ticket. The real jewel was a document of a non-terrestrial officer's sheet. A spreadsheet listing the name of NASA agents to be transferred to new ships or serve on board space stations, but McKinnon noted that none of the names of the vessels existed in any database. Huh. Now, I don't know how much you know about the US government, but they absolutely love it when you poke holes in their important security, triply so if you do it from the comfort of your bedroom in a country away. The US tried their level best to extradite McKinnon, but we're prevented by the crown from serving out a 70 year sentence. McKinnon is doing well. He recently took to the UFO subreddit to answer questions from fans and true believers. There wasn't a whole lot of new information, but it's just nice to know he hasn't been shoved into a black van somewhere. Number two, the Navy and their pilots, Navy pilots. In September 2019, Navy spokesperson Joe Gratisher spoke out on three recently released videos by the Army that contained evidence of unexplained aerial phenomena. The Navy agreed that just this once, they would be willing to talk about something weird they'd seen and recorded because pilots are reportedly encountering bizarre things every day and feel just too uncomfortable to report it. One pilot in particular, Ryan Graves, who's a 10 year vet, has said he believes he's seen thousands of unexplained phenomena in the air in his career. But these go unreported because of the stigma attached to the previous theories about what uh, may or may not be in the videos, in his words. To translate that a bit in layman's terms, the Navy feels that they have to comment so that pilots are willing to talk about that, hey, maybe we're seeing UFOs without feeling too crazy. These videos in question were released from 2017 to 2018 and they feature long, oblong shaped objects captured with infrared that disappear in the Earth's atmosphere. Hey, there it is again, more cylindrical shaped UFOs. Now I'll be clear, I don't really have much of a connection or through line here, but I do think it's very fascinating how many of these stories do mention these cylindrical shaped objects. Far from the earliest or last, in 2004 and in 2015, two similar sightings were reported featuring similar vehicles. Now the purpose of investigating most of these 
these reports is more focused on safety hazards and threats of national security. And at the same time, maybe they're not openly admitting they've got UFOs flying around, but they're getting pretty darn close. The 2004 sighting, I think, is a particularly fascinating one. Two pilots, one Commander Fravor and one Lieutenant Commander Slate, called it in, reporting that they saw objects out of nowhere at some 80,000 feet in the air, and then descending rapidly towards the Pacific Ocean, stopping at around 20,000 feet and hovering in place. They would drop out of radar range or shoot directly up in the sky on a 90 degree angle. You know, normal things aircraft love to do. They weren't American crafts and they weren't recognized by any organizations they'd ever seen. Maybe it's tech not of this world. Number one, government councils. You know the era we're in right now is probably one of the most fascinating times to be invested in UFOs and unexplained alien sightings so consider yourself lucky because it seems like we are getting dangerously close to a government finally confessing it. It feels like we're weeks away some days, you know? The UAP report was a seminal turning point when the Pentagon outright admitted they had thousands of documents and reports and investigations into the possibility of life somewhere out there in the Milky Way. Over the years, there have been a few investigations into unexplained aerial phenomena, but they're usually pretty hush-hush clandestine. Project Blue Book is probably the most famous secret project among them, but that was, you know, a secret. Well, in the interest of trans Transparency. As of October 2022, NASA is coming clean, washing their hands, and opening a new study into the research of extraterrestrial life. 16 hand-picked scientists and specialists have been selected to analyze data and determine how best to go forward when observing events. And they're not really looking at past cases, they're more looking towards future things. And this project will include researchers, Personnel from all divisions, including former astronaut Scott Kelly, who served as the pilot for the Discovery Shuttle and also held the world record for most days in space. So I guess he probably knows one or two things about space, maybe, and I'm sure he's seen something weird. Kelly himself doesn't personally believe in aliens, saying, I think there's probably intelligent life in the universe, but I don't think they visit planet Earth. Why not? We got lots of great stuff out here. We got water slides, we got Vin Diesel, no other planet has those two things, and I'm, I'm sure we got a couple other great things from the human experience. So aliens, come on down when you're ready. We'll welcome you with open arms, and if those were UFOs you sent, we're really sorry that we shot those down. I didn't have anything to do with that. In fifth place, we have the Roswell cover-up. Yes, I know, I often reference Roswell when I talk about aliens and UFOs, but so much can be credited back to that historic summer. Retired NSA specialist William Sells of Noblesville, Indiana, claims that his uncle, Wayne Shell, had been a personal bodyguard to President Harry Truman back in 1947. The two men went to Roswell at the insistence of President of the United States Truman in July after sneaking out of the White House disguised as press. Wayne said they met Major Easley at the crash site. Major Easley promised the President that nothing, none of the bodies from the crash would remain. The Secret Service instituted Operation Doppelganger and provided Harry Truman's double to make sure the press was unaware of Harry's real location. At first, William didn't believe his uncle, exactly, you know, how any rational person would react, until the family opened his military footlocker in his bedroom after his passing around 1969. Inside were letters from FDR and Truman, along with glossy photos of the Yalta Conference with Churchill, Stalin, and FDR. So, uh, where did all the bodies go? That's what I would like to know. In fourth place, we have a gray alien abduction. Grant Rollins, a resident of suburban Maryland, describes himself as a fairly normal bachelor, living in peace until this all went down in December of 2017. He woke up at 1.30 a.m. to the sound of a break-in and went to the bedroom door to confront the intruder, but was suddenly rendered unconscious as he touched the doorknob. Okay, so uh, someone brave. I would have been cowering under the blankets or like in my closet. He woke up naked and cold in a pill-shaped glass container. The lid was open, so he was able to stumble out onto the floor that was near the container. He described feeling sluggish and barely able to walk, but he thought he'd been kidnapped, so he was urgently trying to find an escape route. The room he was in was made of mostly concrete and plastic with fluorescent lights. He managed to limp into a hallway that was tunnel-shaped and followed a blue glow coming from down the hall. As he walked, he came out of the tunnel and entered a large cylindrical room lined with vehicles on hooks along the walls. They were human vehicles, mostly Japanese and German cars and motorcycles, but some vehicles were clearly from the American military. 
That's one way to store a collection. In the center of the room was what looked like a metal tree that was six stories tall with glowing blue leaves. As Grant stumbled closer, he realized this tree was a large metal cylinder and the leaves were capsules similar to the one he'd woken up in, except these still had people inside of them and were radiating a neon blue glow. As he paid more attention to higher up in this tree, Grant noticed some blue wires moving around in the dark area towards the ceiling. These clumps of wires suddenly floated down towards him and turned to reveal that they had faces in them, each with two large dark eyes and narrow slits for noses and mouth. He's compared them in appearance to the typical gray alien face from popular media, with two of the faces frowning and one smiling. There was an exchange of words and charades between himself and the smiling one for roughly 10 minutes, but he was so exhausted and they were so advanced that uh, no important information was shared between them. Eh, too bad. He passed out once again, waking up later face down in a puddle of his own drool on a glass floor. Gross. He was too tired to get up and was barely able to tilt his head up, just enough to take a look around. The room was apparently circular, about 150 square feet in size, and a bright sterile white color. One of the tentacled creatures was in the room, but was busy facing away and operating a set of strange controls with no buttons or levers. Out of exhaustion, Grant's head fell back down, and through the glass floor saw that they had risen out of a deep black hole that was dug into a grassy field, where a rock-shaped lid closed around the hole to cover it. This is when he realized he was in a spacecraft and had actually been in a silo of some sort that's here on Earth. Grant passed out for the last time and was awoken by the sensation of being dropped onto his bed with a hard thud. He checked his phone for the time and saw that it was 6.30 in the morning. Later that day, he found an object that had been inserted and cauterized into his right leg and experienced a run-in with some men in black suits within four days of the abduction. Grant claims that he never believed in abductions or UFOs or men in black, you know, any of that. But now he doesn't have a choice in the matter and is annoyed that there's no official place to get legitimate information information or help on the subject. I'm hoping that after talking about this, I don't see any men in black on my way home today. In third place, we have an Air Force landing cover-up. Quinn Nelson, who wants his location to stay private out of fear for his safety, knew a girl whose dad was stationed at an Air Force base in his state. At the time, there were two Air Force bases and one Marine Air Station in that state, so he feels comfortable making this story known. Quinn said he went to see the girl and stay with her family over a weekend, arriving on the Friday, just in time for family dinner. He and the girl decided to walk over to the base movie theater afterwards to enjoy some private time. And after the movie was done, they were walking back to the family's quarters in the company of many Air Force kids and families who also saw the movie. He said that as they were walking, Air Force Air Police personnel began driving down the base housing streets, ordering the theater goers to the nearest base housing residence. A siren or tone was wailing from somewhere, along with a code being repeated that Quinn refuses to name. The crowd didn't put up any kind of resistance and began moving when they were directed, as if this was a normal occurrence. Something Quinn observed as being weird to him, but hey, he wasn't going to be the only one to put up a fuss. When the group he was walking with arrived at a house, his girlfriend, without knocking, pushed the door open and they all walked in. Quinn said the members of the household were pulling the window drapes closed, sending out folding chairs, offering water, acting like this was a planned gathering instead of some random occurrence. Around an hour or so later, the air police again went up and down the streets, giving the all clear, and somewhere the same siren or tone was sounding. Later that night, his girlfriend's family told him that he must never tell anyone about what had happened on the base, saying that this is what happens when UFOs would land on base property or nearby, something that was apparently very common on Air Force bases. Anyone want to let me know in the comments section if that's true? Consider me intrigued. In second place, we have lizard beings from Colorado. Back in 1968, Hannah and her family were living in a small town around the west end of Montrose County called Uravan, Colorado. One early summer morning, she was awoken by the barking of the family dog named Tippy outside of her bedroom window, which was unusual for the pup, who usually only barked when someone or something was in a yard that they weren't supposed to be. Hannah remembers waking out of a deep sleep and hearing Tippy constantly barking and wondering why her older brother, who slept in the bunk above her, and her parents, who slept on the other side of the wall, weren't telling Tippy to quit it. Finally, Hannah was fed up and decided to turn over in bed and look out the window and was met with a sight she didn't believe at first. There was a small circular ship with its landing gear down and hatch with stairs folded down to the ground. Next to the ship were green lizard-like beings with bright yellow eyes, webbed hands that resembled a bow and arrow, and some had tanks on their backs. 
They had thin bodies, were covered in scales, and had V-shaped toes. According to Hannah, the overall mood was that these beings were searching for something, but she had no idea as to what. Another alien exited the ship, but it was much larger in size than the others, and seemed to be the one giving out orders. This caused Tippy to begin barking aggressively once again, upsetting the aliens who began to approach the dog. Hannah instinctively jumped off her bed and rushed into her parents' room in an attempt to wake her mom, but struggled. Her mom slept as if she was completely out of it, and when she finally awoke, was incredibly sluggish in movement. Hannah explained what was going on outdoors and her concern for Tippy, but the mom was unable to see the creatures, wanting only to go back to sleep. Speaking from experience, my dad would have been the same way if I tried to wake him up. Trust me. Hannah's mom eventually told her to sleep away from the window, and before she fell back to sleep, she remembered seeing two of the lizard beings looking in her room through the window, and no longer hearing any noise from Tippy. When morning came, Hannah rushed outdoors in her PJs to check on the beloved pet, and Tippy was waiting around like nothing had happened. The occurrence was never discussed between Hannah and her mom again, until shortly before her mom's passing in 2016, when she asked Hannah if she remembered seeing the lizard people and their ship back in the yard in Colorado. Creepy. In first place, we have the Voronezhsky abduction. I tried, I promise I tried. 34-year-old Vladimir and his 29-year-old wife, Olga, were at home with their one and a half-year-old son, Arthur, and their daughters, Vanessa and Angelica. Olga had asked their daughters to run an errand, and while returning home, both girls saw an unusual object in the sky, so they rushed home and told their family that they had seen a flying star. Olga told them that it had most likely been a satellite or a plane, but the girls objected and explained that the object had been round, with strange white, yellow, and red flashing lights around its perimeter. Both girls then drew a picture of what they had seen, and despite the fact that they went to different rooms to sketch, both drawings were very similar. The girls then insisted that their parents go outside to look at the sky. Olga and Vladimir saw a distant hovering object in the sky that seemed to move and change shapes. Olga managed to take a photo of the object with her cell phone, but the photo only showed a yellow spot or elongated strip with a black background. The family went back inside, had supper, and went to bed. And while I would love to end this here, y'all know better about how this is about to go. Around 2 a.m., Vladimir suddenly awoke and saw that the whole room was lit by a whitish violet light and tried to wake Olga, who refused to wake up, so he went back to sleep. And seeing as it was 2 in the morning, I would have done the same. The bright lights woke up their youngest daughter, Angelica, who ran to wake her mother. Olga then woke up, saw what the other two had seen, and woke Vladimir back up. He was amazed to see that the ceiling of the room had apparently disappeared or had become totally transparent. Right over them, instead of the ceiling, they could see the open sky and a huge disc-shaped craft hovering right above. Vladimir and Olga ran outside their home, still in their PJs, and could see a hovering disc-shaped UFO emitting the strong lights around 100 feet away. Olga began floating, zooming upwards in a spiral motion, and when Vladimir tried grabbing her legs, he discovered he couldn't control his body. Olga described feeling nauseous, unable to control her body as well. In a state of shock, the couple found themselves teleported inside a room with transparent walls and no furniture. Moments later, the duo witnessed 12 entities enter. The humanoids were short, around 4 feet tall, they had 3 fingers on each hand, and large heads with smooth grey skin. Vladimir didn't notice any mouths, noses, or ears on them, but noticed their large, black, pupilless eyes. The entities had no visible legs, and were moving around like caterpillars. They wore a completely sealed, tight-fitting coverall with masks and hoods that covered their bodies. Only one of the aliens was taller from the rest, easily over six feet tall, and stood behind the other small humanoids, with his face not being visible under his outfit. The short entities approached Olga first, placing her in a deep armchair that resembled a gynecologist's chair, prompting Vladimir, who was now unfrozen, to attempt to rush towards her when he ran into an invisible wall or force field. Two of the aliens approached him, and he asked what was going on, and they reassured him telepathically that you will soon be back home. Vladimir rightfully became angry and attempted to push the aliens away, but was thwarted by more entities grabbing him in an attempt to restrain him. The aliens asked him why he resisted, staring straight into his eyes each time they communicated telepathically, before inserting four metal rods into his chest area, paralyzing him completely. 
So from that moment on, he was unable to move and could only stand there helplessly and watch the aliens experiment on Olga. Somehow, they were able to cut into her stomach without her noticing or using any kind of known surgical instruments. She sensed the smell of her inner organs, feeling unpleasant, but no pain, only tranquility and relaxation. Modern human medicine could apparently stand to learn a thing or two. The aliens seemed to be taking samples from her body and organs, and apparently were now using different instruments to study the organs inside her abdomen. Olga was only able to describe one that looked like a pair of pincers and had three clamps. After the strange procedures, the aliens closed and sewed up her stomach. Now, Before the abduction, Olga had been bothered by stomach pains, and after the abduction, she never suffered from them ever again. The smaller humanoids respectfully called to the taller humanoid by a word that Vladimir has loosely translated as the professor, who explained to Vladimir that their society was like a huge ant colony. After Vladimir was brought in front of the professor, he asked the entity why they had taken him and his wife, with the taller being answering that it had to be done. Both witnesses understood that having such feelings was the central interest of the aliens. The tall alien said, We do not understand you. Why haven't you, intelligent animals, destroyed yourselves yet? How can you survive with your emotions? He said that there was a space war going on at this time in the universe, and that the entity that you call God has implanted much information to Earth and into the waters of it. Those who are against God want that information destroyed. If the Earth is going to be destroyed, the Son of God would arrive to Earth again and will restore everything living in it. Through the transparent surface of the cabin, the duo could see planet Earth approaching and felt that their spacecraft was slowing down. The couple was then returned back to Earth the very same way they were abducted, first in the smaller module and then this large disc-shaped craft and then through the roof of their home inside a beam of light. At 11 a.m. the next morning, Vladimir and his wife Olga awoke, and a while passed before they talked about what had occurred. But after analyzing the mutual identical memories, they understood what had happened had not been a dream, but reality. The whole family underwent extensive medical tests to see if the aliens had left behind any implants to try to find some traces of surgery. By some mysterious manner, Vladimir lost his gray hairs, and his physical powers of endurance increased after the abduction. Olga was cured of her chronic colitis and gained the ability to make a drunken man sober by placing the palm of her head on a man's forehead for two to three minutes. In fifth place today, we have the footage the Pentagon refuses to release from Alaska. Between the dates of February 4th to the 12th of 2023, four different unidentified objects were shot down over Alaska, South Carolina, the Yukon, and the Great Lakes. Well, cockpit audio from F-16 pilots who shot down the UFOs over Lake Huron was released, a spokesman for the Pentagon has confirmed that the footage will not be released in the near future, being quoted directly saying, I can tell you that there is not currently any images or video footage that we can release. The imagery remains classified, and I have not received any information as to the potential timeline on a change in classification. <laughs> <laughs> this refusal is a drastic difference in comparison to the quick release of an Air Force photo of what is believed to have been a Chinese spy balloon that was shot down at the same time over on the East Coast, and footage from when a Russian plane appeared to intentionally collide with a drone last March. Noted UFO researcher John Greenwald requested the footage and photos of the UFO shootdowns be released via a Freedom of Information Act request, with the Pentagon claiming national security exemptions to deny this request. An Air Force official said that the images would reveal cryptology and national security concerns have released, and even the Canadian RCMP are playing coy, having ended their public search for the remains. Now, I don't know about y'all, but that sounds pretty dang suspicious to me. Hey, anyone want to take a random trip to the Yukon just to sightsee? Totally not to recover UFO debris or anything suspicious. Number four, the observatory. In 2007, astronomer Alberto Meyer, living in Busta Arezzo, Italy, and I butchered that pronunciation, made an incredible discovery, almost completely by accident, which is where most scientific progress gets made. He was adjusting the focus of his telescope when he spotted and tracked a UFO as it flew across the surface of the moon. Now, the video shows the portions of the moon that he was focused on in close up mode while tracking a solid black object as it flew over the surface of the moon. And look, I could just describe what is going on in this video, but but I could also let you get your peepers on it and let you decide for yourself. And they say a picture is worth a thousand words, so here's roughly 24,000 words worth of context. Take yourself a look. Pretty weird, huh? That round black object is tracked as he catches just after it passing the Wallace Crater. And yeah, this is how I'm learning that parts of the moon were named. I didn't know there was moon geography. It hovers and hesitates before making a sudden change of path at an exact 45 degree angle. Take your protractor out. The precision and control is what's giving people pause, you know? It seems to move as if it's being controlled and with such mechanical dominance that it seems like it has to be something that's being intentionally driven. And not just a strange rock floating through the stars, or I'm gonna be honest, 
a bug crawling on the lens, which is what I thought it might be. Now, commenters on the video, because this thing went viral when it got posted, pointed out that the object does not decrease in size at all, suggesting that the object isn't close to the moon and rules out the theory that this is a shadow on the surface of the moon from a large object over Earth. I'm only capable of so much, I'm gonna be honest. The science stuff, that's kind of above my pay grade. But I can confirm and offer my speculation on when videos of UFOs look weird, and that's exactly what's going on here. So is this a UFO? Who is to say? Alrighty, in our third place position, we have the Guy Hotel Memo. It's the most requested document in the FBI's archives, right after the photo of Elvis and Nixon riding with an alien. The file has been checked out roughly a million times in the last two years alone. So far as KG cover-ups go, this one's fairly out in the open. But that doesn't make it any less invigorating. It's a single page, an unconfirmed report the FBI never even followed up on. The file in question? It's a memo dated back to March of 1950, authored by one Guy Hotel who served as the director of the FBI field office in Washington, D.C., addressed to FBI director J. Edgar Hoover. In the memo, Hotel was relaying a story seen by an Air Force pilot about something bizarre they had seen in New Mexico, right around the time of Roswell fever. The memo describes flying saucers, circular in shape with raised centers approximately 50 feet in diameter. It goes on to say that inside each saucer was a flight crew, each occupied by three bodies of roughly human shape, but only three feet tall, and bandaged in a manner similar to the blackout suits used by speed flyers and test pilots. The memo goes on to claim that the crafts were found because an aircraft radar had interfered with the controlling mechanisms of the saucer, and concludes by saying, no further evaluation was ever attempted. Mm. It seems like it should be a significantly bigger deal than that, no? No further evaluation? Eh, that's fine. Someone in the Air Force claims that they saw a series of flying saucers, piloted by tiny men in shiny spacesuits not even three years after the Roswell incident, set New Mexico news stations ablaze. Uh, but hey, it's uh, probably nothing. At least there's some comfort in knowing that the government has always behaved like this when it comes to investigating and reporting on possible UAP and UFO sightings. Now, admittedly, there's no footage or photography of the incident to speak of, and it's a bit more government-approved hearsay. Whatever was seen on that day could have been something huge. Or it could have been bogus. I suppose we'll never know. But it is worth mentioning that Project Blue Book was launched not even two years later, investigating UFO sightings in the Air Force. So, um... That's all I'm gonna say on the subject. Number two, the Ryan Graves Report. Lieutenant Ryan Graves is a studied Air Force pilot. If you're a super big UFO enthusiast, you might even recognize the name. He's an F-A-18 Super Hornet pilot who has flown the skies for 10 years and has seen countless UFOs in his time flying for the Navy, seeing all manner of things he couldn't explain. He spoke out saying, these things would be out here all day. Keeping an aircraft in the air requires a significant amount of energy with the speeds we observed, and 12 hours in the air is about 11 hours longer than we'd expect. Now, one one particular incident occurred in late 2014, when a Super Hornet pilot nearly crashed into one of these objects alongside Graves. Some of these objects were caught on plane camera, and we have got some of that footage for you here today. The pilot and his wingman were flying in tandem about 100 feet apart over the Atlantic East when something flew between them. Graves said that the object looked like a sphere encasing a cube. You know regular shape a plane would be. The pilots were concerned because were these things a covert drone program or something suspicious and secretive, government officials would have at least you know, warned them since they had fighter jets flying around for fear of collision. This was the reason the Navy was concerned that perhaps there was more to investigate with this particular encounter of unexplained aerial phenomenon. What was truly unsettling the pilots, you know, besides the fact that there was almost a huge safety crash error there, safety crash error, some of that's words, right? And that was that these crafts were accelerating to hypersonic speeds and then they would stop and turn on a dime, which is not really something the human pilots are capable of, even our best and brightest, Sorry Goose and Maverick. So what did the pilots think they were dealing with? Graves spoke out, saying, We have helicopters that can hover. We have aircraft that can fly at 30,000 feet and right at the surface. But combine all of that into one vehicle of some type with no jet engine, no exhaust plume. So what do we think, my goblins and my ghouls? This does definitely seem like something worth digging into, doesn't it? Definitely seems suspicious, to say the least. Finally, in first place, we have the 2004 series of spottings. On November 14th of 2004, Lieutenant Alex Dietrich was piloting her F.A. 
A18 Super Hornet when she observed an oblong object hovering over the water. It leapt into motion, skimming 500 to 1,000 feet over the waves at around 500 knots, and for those of us Canadian civilians, that's around 925 kilometers per hour. The fighter jet's onboard radar couldn't detect the object, but Alex's weapon system operator in the rear seat, who uh, her name's not public, witnessed it as well. Dietrich has quoted her recollection as, "We were trying to call out what we are seeing to each other and to make sure everybody else is seeing it. It's moving so erratically and so fast that our voices, our minds, and then our radio calls can't keep up with it." The majority of credible modern-day UFO sightings can be credited to those that work in the Air Force, and it should be noted that military pilots are trained at what they call RIS, short for reconnaissance, and referring more specifically in this case to the art of recognizing aircraft by their shapes, paint schemes, unit insignia, and more. On one of the other Super Hornets that launched behind Alex was Lieutenant Commander Chad Underwood, who was able to capture the object on an infrared camera. It was 40 feet long, round and smooth, and quickly received the nickname Tic Tac. Now, I'll let the footage that the US government has confirmed as authentic and unexplained speak for itself, since I know we have the clip handy. Around this time, starting on November 10th to be exact, Gary Voorhees, a petty officer on the USS Princeton guided missile cruiser, had been reporting apparitions on his radar screens in the same area. Triple checking his equipment before he made his report, and being the main technician responsible for the equipment, along with having six years of Navy experience at the time, Voorhees described what he was seeing as impossible. In just seconds, an object had dropped to the waterline from 60,000 feet, hovered, and then zipped away at high velocity, making right angle turns that were quoted as being confounding and defying gravity. Calm down, Wicked fans, I know what I said. The objects returned for the next week, with Voorhees quoted as saying, I was able to see it on the horizon during the night and during the day, and it was definitely a glowing object. Could I tell you for 100% certainty what it was we were tracking? No. Now, footage of this event used to exist, with Gary being able to vividly describe his memories that has since been completely scrubbed from the internet. Now, where have I heard that before? Number five, a sighting from Colorado. When flying over Colorado, one could expect to see tall mountains, vivid landscapes, beautiful lush forests, and clear running rivers, all of which are things I miss while being trapped in this void. Something that you might not expect to see when looking out your airplane window is an unidentified flying object carrying visitors from another world. But just because something is unexpected, doesn't mean it can't happen. As an airline pilot named Jeremy Corbell found out earlier this year. Earlier this year, Jeremy Corbell was flying over Colorado when he saw something he didn't expect. At first, it appeared to be a shooting star, but this theory was thrown out when it appeared to split into three pieces, which then went into a triangle formation. The veteran pilot was so shocked at this that he pulled out his phone and filmed the phenomena. While passing aircraft can often be mistaken for alien ships by people who don't know any better, the fact that this was reported by a pilot who would know if it was simply another plane is very interesting. Multiple theories were put forward, including that the lights were high-altitude reconnaissance drones, but the level of light given off by them disqualified this theory. The pilot described the lights as being unlike anything he had ever seen in his entire career of flying. Over the last few decades, many commercial pilots have apparently seen unusual craft sharing the skies with them, but have been prevented from reporting the incidents by airline companies they work for. Are the airlines worried about their pilots seeming crazy? Or are they worried passengers will be afraid of flying if they know they aren't the only ones up there. Number four, a sighting from the Southeast United Kingdom. You would think that an entire country who have been obsessed with the tales of an extraterrestrial who travels through space and time in a blue police box while kidnapping their citizens to act as his acolytes for the last 60 years wouldn't be too shocked when confronted with evidence that aliens from other planets really exist. But it would seem that no matter how much fiction one consumes, it can still be shocking when confronted with the real thing, as a security guard in England found out in our next entry. When checking CCTV footage from your work, you may be expecting to see animals or even some light crime. But in July 2022, a man in the United Kingdom saw something far stranger visitors from another world. On the screen, he saw a large glowing sphere suddenly appear above a nearby power station complex. It hovered above the station and then just as suddenly disappeared. At first, the man thought it was a flare, but there was no trail showing where it could have been shot from. He continued to look for a rational explanation, checking flight radar to make sure it wasn't a plane or a drone. 
He went outside to see it with his own eyes, but nothing was visible to the naked eye. He brushed it off until a few days later when a co-worker came in claiming to have seen the same light hovering and then disappearing over a nearby field. The workers went back through their CCTV footage and posted the footage online. What exactly did they see in the sky? And where did it go when it disappeared in the blink of an eye? These workers will likely never know and will instead carry these questions around in their heads until the day they die. Number 3. A Sighting in Las Vegas, Nevada Las Vegas is a city that would sound like a city in a science fiction novel if we didn't know for a fact it is real. A city where vice and debauchery are encouraged, with claims that no consequences will be removed remembered once you leave its borders. A flashy city of neon, constructed in the middle of a barren desert. Considering how ridiculous that sounds, and Nevada's already considerable reputation for alleged alien activity, perhaps we should not be surprised that visitors from another world would want to take a look for themselves. Proving that what happens in Vegas does not always stay in Vegas, we have our next entry. A man and his friend were driving home at night when they saw unusual activity in the sky. Two large white orbs of light were floating in the sky. As if this were not shocking enough for the witnesses, smaller red orbs began to appear as if coming from the larger craft. These red lights would fly off on their own, sometimes returning to the larger white orbs. The witnesses claimed that over 25 of these red orbs came out of the craft and flew around, which begs the question. Did they see an alien craft or something else? If it was an alien craft, what was the purpose of these smaller red lights? Were they searching for something? And if they were, did they find it? Was this something sinister, or simply an interstellar game of hungry, hungry hippos? More importantly, why am I asking you? The glowing white orbs reportedly stayed in place for over five hours before eventually disappearing into the night. Number 2. A Sighting in Sacramento For those who are more skeptical, it is understandable that you would not be impressed by a lot of footage that is released of alleged alien encounters. It is often grainy, shaky footage that looks like it was filmed on a potato rather than a camera. And oftentimes, one is right to be skeptical. Oftentimes, things can be mistaken for alien crafts when seen through the lens of a phone camera late at night in the dark. But sometimes, People witness the unexplainable in broad daylight. Such is the case in our next entry from Sacramento, California. In this case, a man was in his yard with his family when he looked at the sky and saw a cone-shaped object flying through the sky. They pointed it out to their parents, who were also in the yard, and all of them did their best to capture footage of the cone-shaped craft. It seemed to morph in shape between a cone and an elliptical shape, but when they zoomed in, they saw that the bottom of the cone was emitting light. It is clearly not a plane, and the light coming out of the bottom is curious to say the least. Number 1. A Sighting in Canton, Ohio when working a full-time job, having the opportunity to relax on your day off with a cold drink in the company of your loved ones is something you look forward to all week. While imagining how you will spend your leisure time, you may imagine a variety of experiences like land darts or barbecuing for your friends and neighbors. Rarely do people imagine that they will be spending their time off witnessing an interaction between the military and an unidentified flying object as is the case in our next entry. On the 10th of November, a man was sitting on his back porch enjoying a well-earned day off when he heard the sound of a military helicopter. The helicopter appeared to be chasing after something. He looked around and saw several small, white glowing shapes moving at high speed away from the helicopter. He grabbed his phone to record what he was seeing, but several of the shapes disappeared before he could record. However, some of them remained and he was able to capture them on film. While this is impressive footage, the most disturbing part of the story for me is the helicopter chasing them. Were they trying to research the UFO, or were they attacking them or chasing them away? Whatever it was, let's hope that it didn't result in any tensions between humanity and an advanced alien race. Number 5 on this list is the Navy UFOs. This is one of the most famous alien or UFO encounters the humans have had in the last few decades. Reader's Digest says, when it comes to extraterrestrial life and making contact with those from outer space, everyone has an opinion. Some think it's all a hack, some are open to speculate, and others still are entirely taken with the tales and stories as old as time, cameras poised in tinfoil hats at the ready. UFOs have fascinated and confused us for years as each new flying saucer or hovercraft sighting makes national news and splits us into two camps. While it's easy to debunk individual stories, it's way harder to argue with the UFOs 
US Department of Defense. In videos leaked back in 2007 and 2017, the Pentagon has aimed to clear up any misconceptions by the public on whether or not the footage that has been circulating was real. In the video, unidentified objects are seen spinning and hovering in the air and above the water while two Navy pilots remark in shock and confusion over the two oblong disc shaped objects. So you may be thinking, well how did the government try to hide it if they were the ones that actually released it? Well they did release it themselves, but we have to remember that that was only after the videos had been leaked. In 2007 and 2017, these videos had made their way to the public without the government stamp of approval. So everyone was freaking out and speculating on what the heck this thing could be and why we hadn't heard anything about it. What the heck it is, I don't know, but why we hadn't heard about it is because the government had chosen not to tell us. The only reason that they inevitably released the videos is because they got their hand caught in the cookie jar. They were found out. They were exposed when these videos were leaked. At that point, they could either continue to vehemently deny something that was clearly pointing towards naval activity, or they could fess up and release it themselves in hopes of taking less public backlash. They opted to do the second one because in their words, they wanted to clear up any misconceptions by the public. That, however, is code for, we got caught and we think that releasing it now would be better for us in the long run. If it was up to them though, these never would have seen the light of day. Which then makes you wonder, how many other videos like this are out there that you and me, we just don't know about? Number four on this list is the O'Hare incident. Chicago's O'Hare International Airport had quite the interesting experience back in 2006. Reader's Digest says, on November 7th, 2006, United Flight 446 was about to depart from Chicago's O'Hare International Airport when a dozen United Airline employees spotted an odd metallic craft hovering over the gate. The employees reported that it hung in the air for several minutes before finally shooting up at breakneck speed into the clouds. The strangest part? The UFO did not register on the airport's radar despite all the witnesses. The FAA declined to investigate, chalking it up to a weather phenomenon. A weather phenomenon. Seriously? Yeah. All right there, guys. Also, for those who don't know, the FAA stands for the Federal Aviation Administration, and they're a government-run agency that deals with pretty much anything that flies. So don't get it twisted, guys. This was definitely the government deciding that they didn't want to do anything with this incident, or at the very least, they didn't want the public to know about it. But you would think that they could come up with a better excuse than a weather incident, right? Like, I don't know about you guys, but I don't think I've ever seen a weather incident cause odd metallic things to hover in the sky. Number three on this list is the seven strange crafts. So this one is really interesting because the government did address it, but they definitely didn't chalk it up to being what a lot of people thought it was in Aliens. Reader's Digest says, a 1952 incident where seven unidentified objects appeared over secure airspace near the Pentagon was captured on film. The crafts were registered on radar and jets were immediately sent to investigate these suspicious strange crafts. However, when the American jets approached that airspace, those seven objects disappeared from the radar. When the jets landed, the objects returned to the radar screen once more. President Harry S. Truman was notified and Air Force Intelligence Director General Sanford held a press conference saying that there were reports made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. It's this group of observations that we're attempting to resolve, but there was no resolution. So we kind of just heard from the government that they were on it, but then didn't really hear anything after that. There was no resolution, or at least there wasn't one that was released to the public. Could I believe that they did actually discover something here, and they just decided that telling the public wouldn't be the best course of action? Absolutely I could. In fact, I almost guarantee it. I highly doubt that the American government would have seen this stuff, and then after one pass with the jet, it's just been like, well, all right, guess nothing's there and then call it quits. No, they definitely would have kept investigating and looking until they discovered something. 
Telling the public about that though, probably wasn't in the cards. Number two on this list is the Richard French incident. So this is definitely one of the bigger cover-ups in UFO government history. Reader's Digest says in the 1950s it was Lieutenant Colonel Richard French's job to explain away UFO phenomena for the government. There was only one problem. Lieutenant Colonel French actually saw alien ships with his own eyes, reports the Daily Mail. At a citizen hearing on disclosure in 2013, the then 83-year-old man told the truth for the first time about what he saw as a young man in the waters of St. John's, Newfoundland, two UFOs that had crashed and sunk in the water, and aliens trying to fix them. They succeeded and took off. He didn't mention UFOs in his report at the time. How's that for a freaky government cover-up? Yeah, so that's about as government cover-up as we can get, guys. My guy legit says UFOs saw aliens and specifically omitted it to save face and not panic the public. I guess the guilt and also just the whole story had been eating away at him for decades, though, and eventually he had to come clean and tell the public. Too little too late, though, with a story like this because we never got an opportunity to investigate these aliens or talk to them or anything. Or at least, that's if he's telling the truth. For all we know, he's still leaving some parts of the story out. Only the government and Richard really know what happened. And number one on this list is the unexpected visitor. A man named Rick Horsels who lived in Texas got a very unexpected and unwanted visitor late one evening at his home. The story goes like this. In 2008, an unfathomably large aircraft hovered above Stevensville, Texas. Many people in the community saw it, and according to the Mutual UFO network, a pilot named Stephen Allen reported that the unusual aircraft was flying at an estimated 3,000 miles per hour and was being chased by fighter jets. Then, a man named Rick Sorrell said he saw the same thing while hunting. Later, Sorrell says a strange man knocked on his door and said, Son, we have the same caliber weapons you have, but we have more of them. You need to shut your mouth about what you saw. Can you imagine getting a knock on your door and it being the government basically telling you that if you say anything, you're gonna die. Yeah, that is definitely an unexpected and unwanted visitor if you ask me. So not only were they threatening citizens, I also didn't hear any reports from the government about that jet that was flying behind the UFO. You'd think that if a jet fighter were deployed to chase down an enemy aircraft in friendly airspace, the public should probably know about it to stay safe. But nope. Absolutely nothing. Total radio silence from the government. How many other times have they gone to someone's house and threatened them like this that we don't know about? How many people have been intimidated by the government to stay silent? Really scary question that Honestly, we might not even want to know the answer to. Number five, the Roswell autopsy. Perhaps one of the most famous pieces of lost alien footage is the infamous Roswell autopsy tape. Maybe you've heard of it. If you're a UFO enthusiast like me, no doubt it's come up before at some point. Roswell was kind of the birthplace of UFO mania, where a lot of the first conspiracy theories and a lot of the public ideas we have about aliens really stem from. If you don't know somehow, the story goes that an alien craft crash landed in Roswell, New Mexico where it was swiftly apprehended by shadowy government agents looking to pull a curtain over the whole thing. Reverse engineered, studied, down to the pilot of the craft, recovered by FBI scientists. Almost immediately after, hushed whispers and rumors of a recorded alien autopsy set conspiracists and enthusiasts' mind ablaze in equal measures. Recorded footage of an alien body being dissected would be undeniable proof with world-shattering consequences and would probably make for some pretty good ratings. Well, the Fox Network would agree with you because in 19 1995, the footage was broadcasted on Fox, presented by legendary thespian and number one guy to trust in regards to human alien relations, one Jonathan Frakes. The film broadcast was not the true footage of the autopsy, but rather a high budget recreation to show for a wider public audience what had happened. The director claims he had seen the original footage from the 1947 autopsy, but couldn't release it. He claims that he spliced shots from the original footage into the faked footage to provide some clarity, but didn't tell us what was real and what wasn't. And he insists that the video wasn't faked, but rather a reconstruction for educational purposes. Now, despite only being a reenactment, the special effects of the footage are remarkable. It does look pretty believable 
unbelievable. It was helmed by industry legend Stan Winston, the special effects warlock responsible for bringing the predator and the aliens alike. The alien body in the footage was filled with sheep guts, chicken entrails, pig knuckles and raspberry jam to create the illusion of an alien filled to bursting with foreign organs and probably tasted halfway decent with a little bit of soy sauce. So was the footage ever actually real or was it all just cooked up to sweep up viewers on a dwindling TV season? The director maintains always that what he saw was real, he just wasn't allowed to show it and did his best to show us what happened. There's an interesting discussion to be had there I think. Was he just showing how easy it is to fraud something, manipulate people into believing whatever they see? Who's to say if the true footage ever did come out? We would even believe it. We would probably just dismiss it the exact same way. But if you want to see way more scary footage, real or not, dismissible or provable, we have got loads and loads of that for you to enjoy. So click through, stay a while, and get scared all night long with Top 5 Scary. I'll be here the whole night and in this building. Number 4. Edgar Mitchell The thing about most alien sightings is that they don't always come from the most reputable of sources. You know, it's usually a random internet post, maybe a blurry shot from an iPhone kind of thing posted on Reddit with a caption like, what is this? Or, you know, it's somebody who's walking home late at night and saw some lights in the sky and didn't know it was a plane. And while I think we should respect the voice of the people and the common man, it'd be nice if we got someone with a little bit of clout to their name. Well luckily we've got more than a few astronauts who've seen bizarre things up there and are willing to share their stories. Edgar Mitchell is one such man. He's stood on the face of the moon before, he helped save the Apollo 14 mission from becoming a disaster, he's the sixth man to ever walk on the moon, and he is a lifelong defender and believer in aliens and UFOs. Mitchell claims that he's seen things that prove existence of life outside the planet. First and foremost, he is a firm believer of the Roswell conspiracy, and he insists that all those stories are true and that the military has been hiding the truth behind what happened at Roswell for decades, adding on to say that it was buried, and the military propagated a covert movement to discredit everything that had happened at Roswell, to deter people from taking any news about UFOs and flying saucers seriously, dismissing it forever as tinfoil hat stuff. Mitchell claims that NASA believes the public wouldn't be able to handle the truth. Come on, we're ready. We're ready, we're all ready, we're big enough now to know the truth. It's like the tooth fairy, we're grown up, we know where the quarters are coming from, just tell us. And Edgar Mitchell's been trying to just tell us. In 2004, Edgar Mitchell told a Florida newspaper that he knew there was a secret cabal inside the American government that took in and studied alien corpses, and that after JFK was removed from office, the group did not answer to the president and didn't include the commander in chief in their briefings. He was quoted saying, they all know that UFOs are real. The question is where they are coming from. A Shadowy organization existing outside the president's control with insider knowledge on aliens and trying to suppress the public. Did Mr. Mitchell just casually confirm the men in black are real? Now NASA themselves obviously denied all of Mitchell's statements, but obviously they would. What government is going to throw their hands up and admit that they have been slicing up alien bodies on the side? Number 3. The First Flying Saucer Now while the Roswell, New Mexico incident was the UFO sighting that really shot alien sightings into the mainstream public consciousness and kind of defined what alien sightings look like, you know, the idea of little gray or green men and flying saucers. It was obviously far from the first alien sighting ever recorded, just kind of the most popular. But not even a few weeks earlier, there was actually another famous sighting, and one that's thought to be the progenitor for sightings of UFOs being thought of as flying saucers. Kenneth Arnold was an American aviator. Unlike most UFO sightings, Kenneth never changed his story once, never made any kind of surrealist, outrageous claims, and stuck to the same story for the rest of his life. He saw weird saucers in the air he couldn't explain. Well, let's take a listen. It was 1947, June the 24th, weeks before Roswell, which occurred in July 1947. Mr. Arnold was flying his private plane over Washington by Mount Rainier. Rainier, I, I've never been to Washington, so you guys gotta forgive me. He was looking for a recently downed transport plane that had a $5,000 bounty the US military was offering in exchange for its finding. As he was approaching the summit, Arnold noticed that he saw nine blinding flashes of light hovering up above. When looking in closer, they resembled ships but looked like disks. Arnold said that he saw them flying in a bizarre pattern, with each position diagonally together, reporting that it reminded him of the tail of a kite. Arnold was an aviation expert and said that the craft seemed far more advanced than anything human beings were capable of at the time, moving at unbelievable speeds. He landed at a nearby airport and told crew that he saw something bizarre he couldn't rationalize, worried that perhaps it could have been missiles being fired at Washington. Reporters interviewed him and he was pressed for several questions, but no one could corroborate or figure out just exactly what it was 
he had seen. Arnold was questioned by the army as well, who took his claims remarkably seriously, as he was a fairly respected and reputable man, and there wasn't really the same culture surrounding aliens and UFOs, and as such, his claim was met with genuine worry. No one ever figured it out, but the story of them being saucers, combined with a saucer seen in New Mexico, led to the public perception of UFOs picturing them as saucers for the better part of 60 years, pretty much to this day. Number 2. The Travis Walton Abduction Now, abduction stories can sometimes be a little much to believe, even for those with the most open minds who want to believe. You know, they all seem kind of the same. It's somebody you maybe can't trust driving home late at night, saw something strange, they woke up in a blinding light room and they got poked and prodded by little grey men. Well, Travis Walton's story is not dissimilar to that. It's pretty out there even by abduction standards, but it's too juicy to pass up. So pop open those ears. In 1975, Travis Walton was working as a logger and was facing a fairly routine day. Six other loggers and him driving around in the forest when they saw something incredibly bright shining at them through the treetops. One of the men claimed it looked like a flattened disc, a saucer of sorts even. Walton stepped out of the bed of the truck to investigate and was struck by some invisible force that knocked him backwards. The rest of the crew panicked and drove away. Huge faux pas, I'll say, leaving your co-worker behind after being struck by an alien, but okay, you think you know somebody. When the crew returned, Walton had vanished. Walton awoke and had thought that he'd been taken to a hospital because he'd found himself in a blindingly bright room and could hear people moving around him. But it wasn't until he got a good look at his doctors that he knew something was amiss. Three feet tall with brown quarter-sized pupils with marshmallow-like skin. Walton freaked out, obviously, as one would probably do, and was swiftly restrained by his captors. He tried to fight them off but was greeted by a tall creature he said resembled a humanoid, but was masked by an intimidating helmet, a kind of Darth Vader looking thing. The masked creature took Walton and escorted him back into the operating room and put a translucent mask over his face. And Walton drifted out of consciousness again, unsure if anything was real. The next thing he remembers is walking alongside a highway as if nothing had ever happened. He eventually finds his way to a phone and called his brother-in-law, who panically asked what had happened. It turned out that Walton had been gone for five days, and he was untraceable. Search parties had formed looking for him, sent dogs and choppers, tracked him from the woods, but no one could find any sign of him, as if he'd blinked out of existence and then blinked right back. Travis swore what happened to him was real, a real abduction, and he's maintained that story ever since that fateful week in 1975. Now, if you think this story is fascinating and you're upset that nobody recorded any of it and there wasn't any footage of what Travis described, well, the tragic news is, yeah, it doesn't exist. You can, however, watch a 90s sci-fi movie that is directly based off Travis's case called Fire in the Sky. I've never seen it, but I'm I'm sure it's on Amazon Prime or something. It's got uh, got Robert Patrick from Terminator 2. He's in it. He's a good actor. Yeah, check it out. And number one, the Rendlesham Forest incident. The incident and conspiracy at Roswell, New Mexico is one of the most famous events in UFO culture. This incident is considered England's Roswell, the Rendlesham Forest incident. Few other alien sightings can boast this many government witnesses, memos, and strange proof. Let's paint the scene. It was December 26, 1980. Oh, nice and festive and Christmas themed. Surrounding Rendlesham Forest in Suffolk, England was a series of Air Force bases and U.S. Army personnel. Two of these stationed officers were John Burroughs and Jim Penniston. On this fateful night, the two of them were concerned by shining bright lights that were seen flying above the base, worrying that it could perhaps have been a threat or a spy plane scouting out their location. Burroughs said that he thought the lights looked like a beacon summoning people over. And over 40 people on the base all agreed, reporting seeing the lights and sharing their concern. So the two men were sent over to Rendlesham Forest to investigate. In their official document, the two men claimed that they had seen a strange, shining, triangular object that was pulsing with colored lights. Neither of the men recognized it as an aircraft from any military across the globe. The craft had seemed far too advanced for anything of this world, black and made out of a smooth, opaque glass. It didn't appear to have any wings or landing gear or even really any methods of propulsion or exhaust. The men describe it as covered in hieroglyphic-like symbols etched onto the hull of the vessel all over. Neither of the men could identify the glyphs as anything they'd seen before. Duh, it's alien stuff. As the craft touched down, nearby animals were being driven into a frenzy, and the airman's equipment started malfunctioning, communications equipment cutting out. The two personnel could no longer call back to the base. Now, not even two days later, the Rendlesham UFO was spotted again. Two days later, the same strange lights were seen hovering above the bases surrounding Rendlesham. This time, the crews came significantly more prepared, waiting and ready for the UFO to make contact. The patrol group had found depressions in the ground, and their Geiger counters started blowing up with noise. And the group hadn't known that they'd come across where the UFO had been, and 
and then right on time, the patrol saw the same craft flying above overhead, disappearing into the night. Years passed, and we're still no closer to understanding just what occurred those faithful sightings. And we may never know. Number five claims from David Grush. Alrighty, so before I completely get into everything, I'd like to elaborate on just how credible this witness is. Whistleblower David Charles Grush is a veteran of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, or NGA, and the NRO, where he served as a representative to the Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force from 2019 to 2021. From late 2021 to July of 2022, he was the NGA co-lead for UAP analysis and is representative to the task force led by the Department of the Navy under the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security. At the NGO, David served as a Senior Intelligence Capabilities Integration Officer, cleared at the top secret compartmented information level. Which, yeah, that's a lot of words. Big word salad. I'll elaborate. From 2016 to 2021, he served with the NRO as Senior Intelligence Officer and led the production of the NRO Director's Daily Briefing. He was a GS-15 civilian, which is the military equivalent of a colonel, and has numerous awards and decorations for his participation in covert and clandestine operations to advance American security. David said the recoveries of partial fragments through and up to intact vehicles have been made for decades through to the present day by the government, its allies, and defense contractors. He said that the craft recovery operations are ongoing at various levels of activity and that individuals on these UAP programs have approached him in his official capacity and disclosed their concerns regarding a multitude of wrongdoings, such as illegal contracting against the federal acquisition regulations and other criminality and the suppression of information across a qualified industrial base and academia. Associates who vouched for David said his information was highly sensitive, proving evidence that materials from objects of non-human origin are in possession of highly secret government programs. Well, would you look at that? Multiple government witnesses. Although locations, program names, and other specific data remain classified, the Inspector General and Intelligence Committee staff were provided with these details. Analysis has determined that the objects retrieved are of non-human origin based on vehicle morphologies and material science testing and the possession of unique atomic arrangements and radiological signatures. So once again, they are of non-human origin. The investigation was centered on extensive interviews with high-level intelligence officials, some of whom are directly involved with the program, and they corroborated this information. David is certain that the information has in the past been illegally withheld from Congress to intentionally thwart legitimate congressional oversight of the UAP program. He has also filed a complaint alleging that he suffered illegal retaliation for his confidential disclosures. In his statements, David claimed that UFO legacy programs have long been concealed within multiple agencies nesting UAP activities in conventional secret access programs without appropriate reporting to various oversight authorities. According to the unclassified complaint, in July of 2021, he had confidentially provided classified information to the Department of Defense Inspector General concerning the withholding of UAP-related information from Congress. Christopher Mellon, who spent nearly 20 years in the U.S. intelligence community and served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, has worked with Congress for years on UAP stuff. He has mentioned that a number of well-placed current and former officials have shared detailed information with them, including the location where a craft was abandoned and recovered. He claims the reason more folks haven't come forward is due to a lack of trust in the leadership of the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office established by Congress. Go figure. The assumption that the United States alone has bullied the other nations into maintaining the secrecy for nearly a century continues to prevail as the primary consensus amongst the public at large. So. You're telling me that credible U.S. officials have been adamant that the government's hiding things? Hmm. Number four, the Go Faster video. So this video, uploaded by the UFO investigative group to the STARS Academy of Arts and Sciences in March of 2018, was secured by a Freedom of Information Act request to the U.S. government. The video in question was taken in 2015 off of the East Coast by a FA-18F fighter jet using the aircraft's onboard Raytheon AN-ASQ-228 advanced targeting forward looking infrared pod. Also known as ATF LIR, which that was a mouthful, and I know myself way too well. If I keep saying that, I'm gonna trip. So we're just gonna call it ATF. ATF is designed to allow pilots to track, target, and destroy targets on the ground at ranges of up to 40 miles. It should be noted that it's good at spotting, but not like engaging aerial targets. The video that we're talking about, nicknamed Go Fast by To The Stars, starts by explaining the various numbers and symbols that appear in the footage. Things like the aircraft's altitude, and you know, the fact that the ATF was pointed ahead and to the left of the Super Hornet. The readout also explains that the aircraft was traveling at 252 knots, and in a 
75 degree turn and the unknown object was approximately 4.4 nautical miles away. The video shows the Super Hornets weapon system operator repeatedly trying to acquire the UFO with the ATF's built in auto tracker, which you know can pick out an object and keep it centered on camera. After two tries, the weapon systems officer, or WSO, shouts, Whoa, got it! To which another person, assumed to be the pilot, says, Woohoo, whoa! What the bleep is that thing the pilot asks and the WSO later says oh my gosh dude to which the pilot replies okay what is it so Couple of things to note, the UFO does not have any kind of hot exhaust trail that would be emitted by a conventional turbine engine appearing to emit no heat on the ATF sensor and you know to further explain why this is a UFO, it doesn't have any visible wings or fins. Through my research I've learned that even cruise missiles such as the American Tomahawk or Russian Caliber have small winglets that should be visible, and other missiles such as the Maverick anti-tank missile have stubby fins. The UFO appears oval-like and does not appear to fly nose first in the direction of travel, which that's kind of what you know our planes do. In third place we have the tales of Edgar Mitchell. Though Edgar was an Apollo astronaut who passed away in 2018 at the age of 85 and had many theories about aliens that he often shared with the public. He believed aliens are real and UFOs from extraterrestrials have visited us before, publicly stating that he thought there was a cover up involving aliens and their visits to Earth. As a sixth man to walk on the moon and a NASA astronaut, his theories and beliefs were among the most credible of UFO believers. Not only was Edgar an astronaut, but he was also a test pilot for the Navy, had an MS in aeronautical engineering, and was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1970. Part of his belief in alien life stemmed from experiences he had returning to Earth from the moon, where he felt more connected with the universe than he ever had before. Edgar has said publicly that he's 90% sure that many of the unidentified flying objects recorded since the 1940s belong to aliens from other planets. When he started speaking out in the late 1990s, he said he was then only coming out with his knowledge because he didn't want to be labeled as a UFO crank, and stood by his beliefs, no matter how much he was criticized. In an interview in 1996, Edgar said there were alien bodies at Roswell, but the government covered it up. In 1998, he called in Washington DC to acknowledge publicly what it knew about alien life. He said he had witnessed he knew personally from intelligence agencies and the military who convinced him that the US government had been covering up UFOs for 50 years, including that evidence that I just mentioned from Roswell. In 2018, he was interviewed and spoke about how the Roswell crash was real, and aliens had contacted humans multiple times. Interestingly enough, Edgar's beliefs were in line with those of Philip James Corso, who was chief, who was chief of US counterintelligence corp in Rome in the 1940s and chief of the Pentagon's foreign technology desk in the 1960s. He even wrote a book, The Day After Roswell, where he said that he moved alien artifacts from the Roswell crash, which were later reverse engineered to develop some of our more advanced technology. In an interview in 1996, Edgar said that he had met with officials from three other countries who had personal encounters with aliens from other planets, not just second-handed information. The evidence of alien contact was strong and classified, including that extraterrestrials were giving technology to the US government. In 2004, Edgar said that the government was studying alien bodies, but stopped sharing that information with presidents after John F. Kennedy. During a radio interview, he said that aliens were far more advanced than us, and we would have been gone a long time ago if they were hostile. Now, while I don't agree with everything he'd said, this was brought up at Congress. In second place, we have the Washington Flap. At 11.40 p.m. on Saturday, July 19th of 1952, Edward, an air traffic controller at the Ronald Reagan Washington National Airport, try saying that five times fast, spotted seven objects on his radar. The objects were around 24 kilometers south-southwest of the city, not following any established flight paths, and no known aircrafts were in the area. Edward's superior, Harry Barnes, a senior air traffic controller at the airport, watched the objects on the radar scope, later writing that they knew immediately that a very strange situation situation existed. The movements were completely radical compared to those of any ordinary aircraft. Harry had two controllers check Edward's radar, and they found it was working normally. He then called National Airport's radar equipped control tower, and the controllers there said that they had also, you know, found unidentified blips on the radar screen, and saw a hovering bright light in the sky that was moving at speeds they couldn't understand. At this point, other objects appeared in all sectors of the radar scope, and when they moved over the White House and the United States Capitol, Harry then called the Andrews Air Force Base, which was around 10 miles away. Although they reported that they had no unusual objects on their radar, an airman soon called the base's control tower to report the sighting of a strange object. Um, that airman being William Brady, who was in the tower, he saw an object which appeared to be like an orange ball of fire, trailing a tail, saying it was unlike anything he had ever seen before. As William tried to alert the other personnel in the tower, the object, you know, took off at an unbelievable speed. On one of National Airport's runways, pilot S.C. Pyramid was waiting on the cockpit of his plane for permission to take off. After spotting what he believed to be a meteor, he was told that the control tower's radar had detected unknown objects 
objects closing in on his position. Pierman observed six objects that he described as white, tailless, fast moving lights over a 14 minute period. He was in radio contact with Harry during his sighting, and Harry later reported that each sighting coincided with a pip that could be seen near his plane. When he reported that the lights streaked off at a high speed, it disappeared on their scope. Meanwhile, back at the Andrews Air Force Base, Staff Sergeant Charles Davenport observed an orange red light to the south where the light would appear to stand still and then make an abrupt change in direction and altitude, with the phenomena happening over several times. At one point, both radar centers at National Airport and the radar at Andrews Air Force Base were tracking this object, you know, hovering over a radio beacon. The object vanished in all three radar centers at the same time. At 3 a.m., shortly before two United States Air Force jets from Newcastle Air Force Base in Delaware arrived over Washington, all the objects went However, when the jets ran low on fuel and left, the objects returned, which convinced Harry that the UFOs were monitoring radio traffic and behaving accordingly. The objects were last detected by radar at 5.30 a.m., and the government later tried dismissing the events of that day on a temperature blip, but those who were present have been adamant otherwise. Number 1. The Nimitz Tic Tac On November 14th of 2004, Lieutenant Alex Dietrich was piloting her FA-18 Super Hornet and she observed an oblong object hovering over the water. It leapt into motion, skimming 500 to 1,000 feet over the waves at around 500 knots. The fighter jet's onboard radar couldn't really detect the object, but Alex's weapon systems operator in the rear seat you know, witnessed it as well. She has quoted her recollection as, We were trying to call out what we were seeing to each other and making sure everybody else is seeing it. It's moving so erratically and so fast that our voices, our minds, and that our radio calls just can't keep up with it. A majority of credible modern day UFO sightings can be credited to those that work in the Air Force, and it should be noted that military pilots are trained at what they call RIS, short for recognizance, and referring more specifically in this case to the art of recognizing aircrafts by their shapes, paint schemes, unit insignia, and more. One of the other Super Hornets that launched behind Alex was Lieutenant Commander Chad Underwood, who was able to capture the object on an infrared camera. It was 40 feet long, round and smooth, and quickly received the nickname Tic Tac. Now, I'll let the footage that the US government has confirmed as authentic and actually and speak for itself, since I know we have the clip handy. Around this time, starting on November 10th to be exact, Gary Voorhees, a petty officer on the USS Princeton guided missile cruiser, had been reporting apparitions on his radar screens in the same area. Triple checking his equipment before he made his report, and being the main technician responsible for the equipment, along with having six years of Navy experience at the time, he described what he was seeing as impossible. In just seconds, an object had dropped to the waterline from 60,000 feet, hovered, and then zipped away at high velocity, making right angle turns that were quoted as being confounding and defying gravity. The objects returned for the next week, with Voorhees quoted as saying, I was able to see it on the horizon during the night and during the day, and it was definitely a glowing object. Could I tell you for 100% certainty what it was we were tracking? No. Now, footage of this event used to exist, with Gary being able to vividly describe his memories, but has since been completely scrubbed from the internet. I'm just gonna give the Pentagon my usual dose of side eye. Don't mind me. Number 5. TikTok Sighting Our first entry on this list comes to us from a very reputable source. TikTok. TikTok user Drillabang, who posted this video recently online. The caption, we caught them out there, is almost Mulder's catchphrase of the truth is out there. Almost. And it seems like they are. The video shows a short clip of someone filming the sky and clouds. And passing through the clouds slowly is something. It's kind of hard to tell. It's an unidentified flying object. A small black being with what looks like tentacles protruding from it, like a little black jellyfish. The entity is moving slowly through the sky with what looks like an electrical field following all around it. The being appears to be electrical, possibly a small mechanical drone. My first thought looking at one of these things is just how much this thing looks like the Sentinels from the Matrix. Could very well be evidence of the simulation leaking through. Uh, this clip is undeniably pretty odd. It's hard to make out just how big this flying entity is, although it does look a little bit small, but really, it's hard to tell. Is it a spacecraft? Is it a living being, but biomechanical? Is it a drone? Of course, it has to be said, the clip, as impressive as it is, could very well be a high production hoax. Like I said, the thing really does look a little too perfect for me, and it looks a lot like one of those Matrix Sentinels. I honestly wouldn't even be surprised if it's a shrunken down 3D model of it used for the video. But real or fake, you can't deny that the video is captivating and has people talking. Well, what do you think? Let me know down in the comments about this one if you think this has you convinced. And hey, while I've got you here listening, you want to see a whole lot more spooky stuff this month? Well, I got news for you, pal. I got boxes full of spooky stuff. Subscribe for a fresh fright in your inbox delivered daily. Number 4. Chilean UFO Our next entry was posted to Reddit on r slash aliens. I mean, where else are you going to find alien clips? The video posted is filmed from a mountain in Chile, where a group of friends on a hike found something amazing in the sky and luckily had their phones on them to record it. This entity floating around them doesn't really look like your traditional UFO sightings. It looks like a ball of pure energy just hovering above them in a triangular shape, looking like distilled pure light or just some photons or something. 
Looking around in the background, you can see there's nothing around them. No airports, no mysterious army bases nearby. Just a big mountain range and a bizarre glowing ball of light hovering around aimlessly. A user on Reddit offered a rudimentary translation of the friends talking, which adds a little bit of insight to the clip. We can hear the friends joking that it could be a spirit bomb from Goku and there's going to be an epic duel soon. Goku is uh, technically an alien, so I guess if Goku was real and you saw him flying around on the Nimbus cloud, that would qualify for a UFO sighting. They go on to joke that it looks like something out of the movie Independence Day. It's really hard to say just what this thing is. Now, usually I tend to roll a little bit more Scully than Mulder, and I'm naturally a bit skeptic, but I am completely out of ideas looking at this thing. The edges of the triangle are so very visible, and it doesn't really seem like it follows any one particular flight pattern. I can't take even the slightest guess what this might be, so your guess is just as good as mine, my ghouls and goblins. Take a look for yourself and decide for yourself what the answer is. Number three, the Ring of Light. Another entry coming to us fresh from Reddit, posted by user Jesse Zell. A short clip that shows us something incredibly bizarre. The clip is captioned appropriately, the most unexplained thing I have ever seen in my life, and I'm strongly inclined to agree. Take a little look-see. In the clip, we get a pretty good shot at a suburban house and the overcast night sky above. A little bit above the house, there appears to be a ring of light that appears, circling around, appearing a few lights at a time, rounding the house a few times. That's bizarre. Even the skeptics should buy into this one. I mean, it's easy to just imagine a flying saucer hovering a little bit out of view atop the clouds, descending its undercarriage lights on the neighborhood. A user in the comments proposed that it could just be nothing more than a series of spotlights. But the original poster and uploader of the video insists that from where they were standing, the lights are appearing above the clouds, not below them. And even then, what explains the perfectly circular pattern displayed? The user goes on to say that there was no particularly loud noises emanating from around the skies, and it was very hard to make out what was happening. They go on to add that they're very familiar with drones and have drones flying around their home with some regularity. I'm hoping they mean just a neighbor or an enthusiast and not that they're being watched. And that they would recognize a drone if there was one and that they are certain these lights were not caused by drones. So just what is causing it? What was it? Is this Reddit user being observed by someone from the stars? Are they potentially a target for an abduction? We eagerly await a follow up on this one. Number two, the cube. Posted to YouTube by user, well, fittingly named, is this a UFO? This brief 20 second clip showcases a pilot filming from inside the cockpit. Also, side note before I start talking about all the alien stuff, is that safe? Are you allowed to be doing that? I, I guess the plane doesn't crash in the video, so I'll take their word for it. Anyway, the clip is really short and sweet. We see from the window that there's a small cuboid-like shape blasting through the sky. The footage is extremely clear, unlike most UFO footage, and it's really easy to see what's happening, although it doesn't help matters much or provide you with any clear answers. What we can see is a small black cube propelling itself forward. There's no trail of smoke, no lights flashing, just a small black cube flying around. So what is that? Some comments in the video suggest that it could be a weather balloon or a helium balloon. Although I gotta say the altitude is a bit questionable or why it's traveling horizontally so fast. It's travel in the video does seem a bit pointed and intentional, like it's trying to get somewhere. Although that could just be me wanting to apply sentient traits for it because I badly want to believe. Interestingly though, in 2014, a report from a 10-year Navy pilot veteran, Lieutenant Ryan Graves, claims that in his service, he would see UFOs nigh daily and would report them constantly, only to have his reports ignored. Interesting. He said in his time in the service, he'd see unexplainable objects flying by him at hypersonic speeds with no trails, no exhaust, often 30,000 feet up in the air undetected by his radar. He said one of the more consistent things that he would see was an object that looked like a sphere encased in a cube. Kinda sounds a bit like the cube propelling itself forward in this clip, doesn't it? Fascinatingly, after this report from Graves, the Navy announced it would be changing the way it handled UFO reports internally. Perhaps there's something they know and they're not telling us. Number one, the laser pointer. And finally, we're down to our number one clip. Now this is my favorite clip of the bunch, by far, I mean, I would hope so, otherwise why would I bother putting it at the number one spot? This clip also comes to us from Reddit, from user Luke511, filming above him what appears to be a ball of light bouncing around bizarrely in the sky. A UFO if I've ever seen one. Luke, who when faced with the dangers of the unknown, the wonders of the cosmos, possibly standing on a chance to make that fabled first contact with another civilization with unknown frontiers, stood proudly and takes a laser pointer out and starts flashing it upwards to the sky. Now I have 
nothing but respect for this absolute madman who got right down to brass tacks. Because him flashing that laser pointer made this video go from, oh, maybe that's a UFO, to, oh, that is definitely a spacecraft being piloted by an intelligent being. In the video, as soon as you see him flashing it around, the vehicle maneuvers on a dime, trying clearly to avoid the laser, which is pretty damning. Now the reason I love this clip so 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 much, besides the fact that I do think it's pretty concrete evidence, assume these really are aliens flying around in that spacecraft. Imagine you're coming down to a new planet and you see a green beam coming from the ground pointing directly at you. Do you think they were freaking out? Do you think they were losing their minds panicking that they got made? That that laser was gonna come for them and destroy them? Or do you think it was more like a kitten situation? Like they saw the laser and got distracted by a really enticing game of intergalactic chase. Luke 511, this has got to be a top moment for humanity and for you as a whole. Tagging a UFO with a laser beam and potentially scaring alien life has got to be a landmark moment for us as a species. My only concern is that maybe this event might have sent intergalactic relations back just a little bit. I'm hoping aliens aren't afraid to visit the planet now because of the danger of green lights. We'll turn them off, we promise. We're sorry, it was just a little prank. Number five, the Phoenix Lights. If you ask most people what the most famous UFO sighting in the world was, they might say the Roswell, New Mexico incident. It's definitely the most referenced in pop culture. There's a CW TV show about it that's had like 10 seasons. Roswell is almost synonymous with the concept of flying saucers. But the most documented UFO sighting occurred in 1997 in Phoenix, Arizona, when a series of bright lights in the sky were seen together by hundreds of people. Okay, this isn't just some passing dot, this was something hundreds of people corroborated on. Now like any good UFO sighting, there's no real concrete answer as to what happened and only speculation to go on. So let's run through the facts. It was on March 13, 1997. Hundreds of people around Phoenix described seeing these vivid bright lights around 6 or 7 total. Now reports claim that these mysterious lights were huge and big enough that they were blocking out your vision of the clouds, the stars, but they wouldn't produce any noise like a jet or a helicopter or anything. Big, blocky, silent. A few hours later on that same night, a second wave of sightings came over the city, describing a long trail of blinking objects that some said was a mile long and boomerang shape. They were blinking in regular intervals, orange and blue lights. Air traffic controllers reported seeing these lights, but didn't detect any planes on the radar. And the air traffic controllers described this incident as inexplicable. But maybe the strangest part about all this, maybe just to me, is that the first person who called in the sighting was legendary 80s mullet owner and actor Kurt Russell who was flying into the city with his son. Snake Plissken asked what the strange lights hovering over the city was, leading to Kurt Russell calling it in. The only thing he got back from air traffic control was, we don't show anything. Now officially the military would claim that this was a test for high intensity flares, but eyewitnesses weren't so convinced. The governor of Arizona at the time, who was a former Air Force officer, claimed that the aircrafts he saw that day didn't resemble anything he had ever seen in his life. So, what happened in Arizona that day? Was it a widespread enough hoax, government cover-up, or proof of life from beyond the stars? You tell me. And if you're looking for more UFO videos, you already know we have got that and then some. Click on through to the channel, we've literally got hundreds of UFO videos. You could be watching them for the rest of the evening. But if UFO stuff ain't your jam, we've got cryptids, conspiracies, true crime, fake crime, pretty much anything you could want. So hit subscribe, hit that little bell, and don't miss a single thing. But do it at the end of this video, would you kindly? We got way more UFO sightings coming up for you. Number four, Japanese flight 1268. Our next sighting comes to us out of Japan. Well, the skies of Japan. It's a video about flying objects after all. It was in November of 1986 when a pilot on a cargo flight thought that he made a close encounter of the third kind. When Captain Kenju Tarauchi and a skeleton crew were flying a cargo delivery of some fancy bougie French wines into Japan, when Captain Tarauchi claims he saw shining bright lights surrounding both wings of the plane. Now initially, Tarauchi said at the time he thought that this was just US flown fighter jets patrolling around the border of the Soviet Union. Union. But when he got a decent look at the craft, he realized these weren't friends of Uncle Sam. He said, Two spaceships stopped in front of our face, shooting off bright lights. He continued saying, The inside of the cockpit shined brightly, and I felt warm in the face. These aircraft in particular were described as being cuboid, I guess they're Borg ships, with jet propulsion systems clustered around a dark center. At the same time that these unidentified objects were soaring by the plane, 
these objects seemed like they were jamming the plane's communications in some way. As Tarauchi and the crew couldn't contact ground control at all during the sighting, as if there was some electromagnetic field. The rest of the crew, however, wasn't quite as convinced by this strange encounter, with the co-pilot and flight engineer believing that the objects they saw were not but strange lights, and agreed that they were definitely unexplained and they couldn't find a reasonable possibility for what they were, but that they didn't necessarily think they were flying saucers. A committee looking into the phenomena claims that it was just light refraction through ice crystals suspended in the clouds, but that doesn't quite explain how the cockpit got warm or anything like that or where the communications were going. So what do you think? Aliens or ice crystals? Number 3. The Betty and Barney Hill Incident It's sad how many people see a UFO and no one else in the entire world will believe them. You know, not their friends, not their family. That's why this case is different. A young married couple claims that not only they saw a UFO together, but they were abducted together. That's one for the memory books. You know, they say the couple that probes together stays together. It's a fairly well documented case. It even served as the inspiration behind the alien abduction story in American Horror Story Asylum. And how about Evan Peters? Huh? Love that guy. Anyway, the real story revolved around Barney and Betty Hill in 1961. The two of them were driving home through New Hampshire when they both saw a blinding bright light flying above them in the sky. Betty started to feel dizzy and the two of them soon found themselves asleep on the road. A moment passed and they found themselves parked in their driveway two full hours later, not remembering a second of what had happened. The couple claimed that they had traveled to a star system 39 light years away called Zeta Reticuli. The two had connections and were able to get in contact with Air Force officials to report their strange sighting and would spend the next few years trying to explain their case to anyone who would listen in the desperate hopes of getting some help and some answers. Barney would meet with a psychiatrist regularly who he told that he kept having nightmares where he was being operated on by small gray skinned slanted eyed creatures that would take samples of his skin, his fingernails, his flesh to do with he did not know. So the psychiatrist had him undergo hypnosis therapy. His wife as well, hoping perhaps that something repressed could be unearthed and maybe they should have left it alone because what they found was terrifying. When going under hypnosis and waking back up, Betty was able to draw a scientifically accurate map of the star system from memory, creating a map that was nearly spot on to the real Zeta Reticuli. This incident inspired the Air Force to launch Project Blue Book to collect more stories of UFO abductions like this. Number 2. Kenneth Arnold If you've ever wondered why flying saucers became the default term for UFOs as opposed to something like flying cigars or flying triangles, it has a very large part to do with this next story, which was one of the first big mainstream sightings of a UFO in 1947. Now interestingly, possibly coincidentally, possibly not, this incident occurred only a few weeks before the infamous Roswell, New Mexico incident. So UFO fever was just on the brain around 1947. This happened to Kenneth Arnold, a clean cut all American aviator. He was flying a small private plane over Washington around Mount Rainier on a scavenger hunt of sorts for the wreckage of a downed plane which had a fairly significant reward offered by the army for its salvage, which Kenneth was after of course. While he was prospecting, Arnold claims to have seen nine blinding, nine blinding bright flashes of light, flying in a bizarre pattern like the tail of a kite. Described as saucers moving at an incredible speed, Arnold tried to do his level best to assess what these things were from the seat of his aircraft, working out how fast they were moving, taking his watch and clocking from when they reached the peak of the mountain. He worked out that they were going about 1700 miles per hour, which is pretty darn fast considering in 1947 humans had just broken the sound barrier at 700 miles per hour and that was an unbelievable leap in technology. Whatever it was Kenneth saw, it was something far more advanced than anything he'd ever seen on earth. When he'd landed, he told the crew at the airport about everything that he'd seen, suggesting that he'd seen missiles or maybe some experimental new tech. For weeks after, Arnold would become a media darling, being interviewed by several reporters all hoping to get the big scoop on this. Part of what made this such a defining UFO story for the American people was how earnest Arnold was about his story. He was an honest man who provided straightforward facts, experience with aviation, a mathematical and rational approach to all of this, and very little in the way of wild speculation. 
which is a shame, because I love wild speculation. Let's do a little more wild speculating with our last point. Number one, the Betty Cash incident. In December 29, 1980, Betty Cash would see something on the outskirts of Houston near Dayton that would change the course of her life forever. She was driving with her friend, Vicki Landrum, and Landrum's grandson. At around 9 p.m., the three of them noticed a blinding bright light in the sky. Landrum believed it to be the second coming of Jesus, whereas Betty Cash described described it like this. We didn't know what it was, but we knew that it was something lighting up the sky. We all began to feel this heat, and all of a sudden Vicky screamed for me to stop. And when I stopped, she went forward, and her handprint was embedded into the dashboard of the car. And I thought, well, I've got to see what this is. So I got out, I walked towards the front of the car, and I stood there looking up to try and figure out what this object was, and then a diamond-shaped object appeared with flames shooting out. The heat was tremendous. When I reached for the door handle, it was so hot I couldn't even begin to open it. The only thing I was thinking while all this was happening was, are we going to make it out of this alive? Landrum stated that moments later, a large squadron of black helicopters took over the sky above the area. After the choppers cleared, Betty took the Landrums home and retired for the night. The next morning, Miss Cash said she was extremely sick, suffering from nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, weakness, and intense burning in her eyes. Now, bizarrely, Landrum and her grandson all reported the same symptoms. These symptoms would worsen pretty seriously, with large blisters forming on the skin, and eventually Betty Cash had to be taken to a hospital where she was suffering from cancer symptoms, where she lost large patches of skin and clumps of hair. Now, to date, there has never been a conclusive answer to what happened to Cash and Landrum. What caused the radiation sickness? Was it the military testing new technology? Was it a craft from another world? Number five, an alien body. Yep, kicking today off with a corpse. Go figure. Do you expect anything less? This tale takes place in Russia, and while I don't exactly recommend physically trying to travel there right now for, um, reasons, we shall take this trip virtually. Eugenia Popova of Petrobadovsk. City first reported in 2011 that she had been keeping a frozen alien body in a refrigerator for a couple of years. You know, just casually. I do have a couple of questions. Did she keep it next to her food? Was it a spare fridge? Did it smell? Allegedly, she found it next to her summer house, so I suppose we can assume it was a fridge that wasn't used as much? On the original day that she discovered the body, Eugenia claimed that she was disturbed by a terrible noise that shook her from her sleep, describing it as deafening, screeching, and overpowering. She rushed outdoors and came across the boiling hot alien remains lying next to metal fragments. The creature was between 40 to 50 centimeters long, had a big head, mouth, and orbits, and was wearing a one-piece garment of some sort. Two days after going public with her story, Eugenia was visited by some people who confiscated the body for the purpose of investigation, and according to their words, took it to the Karelian Research Center of the Russian Academy of Sciences. However, employees of the research center who were interviewed later said that they had never heard of the discovery. I'm sensing an all too familiar government cover up here. How about you folks at home? Honestly, if the photos weren't as convincing as they are, I probably wouldn't have included it in today's list, but I just couldn't tear my eyes away from how strange it looks. Number four, Skinny Bob. Yes, I'm aware this is a controversial series of videos, but I truly believe that there's enough to believe, you know, to prove the validity of the clips. A very curious video showed up on YouTube in 2011, showing a collection of leaked videos that allegedly shows an alien being interrogated by some government agency, possibly the KGB. So if I go missing tomorrow, Y'all know why now. An alien that looks like a typical gray type entity is shown being interviewed and examined, supposedly as part of some sort of diplomatic exchange. The creature is described as being from the Zeta Reticuli star system, sent as part of an envoy to discuss matters of mutual concern. According to the videos, the aliens would be escorted by special officers and only meet with high ranking officials. Although several aliens are claimed to have been present, the one most prominently featured has been given the nickname Skitty Bob. The alien appears as a very thin, slouched over figure with an oversized bald head, slit like mouth, large eyes that seem expressive and blink, and claw like hands. There was apparently a whole series of interviews conducted with the creature between 1942 and 1969, although only a few clips have managed to get leaked out. The most well known clip simply shows Skinny Bob sitting at a table, apparently in a telepathic interview, after which we see footage of the alien from head to toe, showing its disproportionately long arms and overall build. After that, there is a shot of it within a pool of some sort of liquid where it supposedly slept. 
According to the videos, the aliens were often filmed without their knowledge or agreement, with document 072-E supposedly describing an incident in 1961 where three of the beings realized that they were being secretly filmed by a hidden device, which was considered a violation of their agreement. There was a treaty that stipulated that photographs and filming of the entities would not be allowed unless specific permission was given. While these two clips are the most well-known and widely available, there were allegedly other clips that have since been taken down, such as that of the alien spacecraft and another of an autopsy being performed on a dead specimen at the base. I will admit there have been many assumptions that this footage was faked, but let's review the evidence here. The budget to pull off this sort of high quality costuming and filming would have been over $250,000 alone, and no one has claimed responsibility or tried to monetize the footage in any way. Many CGI experts and those in movie industry, you know, have studied the footage and most agree that if fake, it's the work of a studio with a big budget. Number three, the tales of Edgar Mitchell. Edgar was an Apollo astronaut who passed away in 2018 at the age of 85 and had many theories about aliens that he often shared with the public. He believed aliens are real and UFOs from extraterrestrials have visited us before, publicly stating that he thought there was a cover up involving aliens and their visits to Earth. As the sixth man to walk the moon and a NASA astronaut, his theories and beliefs were among the most credible of UFO believers. Not only was Edgar an astronaut, but he was also a test pilot for the Navy, had an MS in aeronautical engineering, and was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1970. Part of his belief in alien life stemmed from experiences he had returning to Earth from the moon, where he felt more connected with the universe than he ever had before. Edgar has said publicly that he's 90% sure that many of the unidentified flying objects recorded since the 1940s belong to aliens from other planets. When he started speaking out in the around the 1990s, he said he was only then coming out with his knowledge because he didn't want to be labeled a UFO crank, and stood by his beliefs no matter how much he was criticized. Which, like, I get it. In an interview in 1996, Edgar said that there were alien bodies at Roswell, but the government covered it up. In 1998, he called on Washington, D.C. to acknowledge publicly what it knew about alien life. He said he had witnesses he knew personally from intelligence agencies and the military who convinced him the U.S. government had been covering up UFOs for 50 years, including evidence from Roswell. In 2008, he was interviewed and spoke about how the Roswell crash was real and aliens had contacted humans multiple times. Interestingly, Edgar's beliefs were in line with those of Philip James Corso, who was chief of U.S. Counterintelligence Corp in Rome in the 1940s and chief of the Pentagon's foreign technology desk in the 1960s. He even wrote a book, The Day After Roswell, where he said that he moved alien artifacts from the Roswell crash, which were later reverse engineered to develop some of our more advanced technology. In an interview in 1996, Edgar said he had met with officials from three three other countries who had personal encounters with aliens from other planets, not just secondhand information. The evidence of alien contact was strong and classified, including that extraterrestrials were giving technology to the US government. In 2004, Edgar said that the government was studying alien bodies, but stopped sharing that information with presidents after John F. Kennedy. During a radio interview, he said that aliens were far more advanced than us, and we would have been gone a long time ago if they were hostile. Well, a witness doesn't really get more credible than that. Number two, Roswell. Look, whether you like it or not, Roswell is easily the most popular and controversial alien and UFO spotting to this day, and there is so much lore around it to not mention it consistently. Former CIA agent Oscar Wayne Wolf claims he saw both living aliens, retrieved parts, and remains of alien ships throughout his career. Hmm, where have I said this before? The agent made these shocking claims about the infamous Area 51, claiming he caught a glimpse of an extraterrestrial spacecraft and a living alien. The 77-year-old man was speaking to UFO researcher Richard Dolan, but concerned about giving up his true identity at the time, went by the anonymous, which I get. After the agent made his claims, it was then shared at the Citizens Hearing on Disclosure held at the National Press Club in Washington in 2013. The agent is understood to have used a fake name throughout his career in the CIA, so the chances of his real name having been used in the account were never super high. He worked for the CIA between 1957 and 1960, where he spent time in a military base in the southeast US where they analyzed physical evidence. In 2013, fearing he might soon pass away, the anonymous came forward for one more conversation this time with Richard Dolan. He claims that he was taken into Area 51 to look at items allegedly found and retrieved by the US government. He also claimed among them was a flying saucer that crashed and landed in July of 1947 in, you guessed it, Roswell, New Mexico. He stated there were live aliens there and that he was taken to the S-4 facility in Area 51. In his statement, he described seeing different saucer crafts in the facility with the first place he visited holding the Roswell craft and it was kind of crashed up, but apparently every alien that was in it died except for a few. The Roswell craft was really strange because it looked like really heavy aluminum foil. 
At S4, he viewed the autopsy film, where the colonel on screen said, What we've got here is we're interviewing a gray alien. Now, the anonymous had no idea he was going to see the film, saying the alien didn't look human as far as the skin tone and basically the shape of it and the size of its head compared with a normal human. Following the interview, he was warned by the CIA not to conduct any further interviews or disclosures. Well, once again, if you never see me again, you know why. Number one, Russian soccer players. Hmm, another Russian spotting. Interesting. On September 27th of 1989 in Voronezh, Russia, several young folks claimed to have seen a nine foot tall, three eyed alien with a robot escort. This case was reported in the United States by the St. Louis Dispatch. And it was originally published on October 11th in the US, but its origin was the Russian newspaper TASS. The original details of the case were brought forward by Jenrik Silanov, head of the Voronezh. Geophysical Laboratory, who gave the details to the TASS agency. Silanov stated that the media took an enormous amount of creative freedom with his report. The agency had informed the entire world that Russian scientists had confirmed that an alien spaceship carrying giants with tiny heads had landed in Voronezh, a city of over 800,000 people located around 300 miles southeast of Moscow. They stated that as many as three of these giant creatures had emerged from the alien ship, and the ship was described as a large shining ball. These creatures were said to have walked in a nearby park accompanied by a menacing robot. The task this account stated that the UFO landed in Voronezh on September 27, 1989 at 6.30 p.m. Young boys playing soccer witnessed the event, stating that a pinkish glow preceded the descent of the unusual flying craft, becoming a deep red as it touched down, and most witnesses described the object as a flattened sort of disc shape. A crowd quickly gathered, no kidding, and peered through a hatch that opened, which is when they saw a three-eyed alien about 10 feet tall, clad in silvery overalls and bronze-colored boots and wearing a disc on his chest. Now, the account also stated that a boy screamed with fear, but when the alien gazed at him, with eyes shining, he fell silent and unable to move. Onlookers screamed, and the UFO and the creatures disappeared. And according to the report, about five minutes later, they came back. The alien held a tube about 20 inches long, which it pointed at an unidentified 16-year-old boy, making him disappear. The alien went inside the sphere, which then took off, and at the same time, the boy reappeared. Eyewitnesses had been questioned by police workers and journalists, and there were no discrepancies in the description of the sphere itself or the actions of the aliens. Now, TASS listed the three witnesses' names, all of them were youngsters, and stated that a group of international researchers would be investigating the claims of the witnesses. Residents interviewed later claimed they'd observed this UFO not just during the above incident, but also many times on September 21st, 23rd, 29th, and October 2nd, all between 6 to 9 p.m. And this all remains an unsolved mystery. Number five, Mars. The goal of the Mars Exploration Program is, quote, to explore Mars and to provide a continuous flow of scientific information and discovery through a carefully selected series of robot orbiters, landers, and mobile laboratories interconnected by a high bandwidth Mars Earth communications network. Okay, yeah, that's great and all, but like, are you selecting which pictures you share with us? Because we'd love to see what the planet looks like in 4K, please. I know I would. I think it's funny that we can see an infrared cloud into the vast distances of space with the new Webb telescope, yet 4K pictures still none of the other side of the moon. Huh, that's weird. I mean, it's a lot closer if we wanted to start there, you know? But Mars is great too. We've all seen the pictures of right angles and impossibly formed canyons and craters from Perseverance to get an idea of what exactly the red planet looks like. Yeah, it's red. And sandy, like PEI sand. But we're starting to see some weirder and weirder stuff from NASA as it collects scientific information up there. Like, say, this potential crash landing site. I mean, if it was a crater, bigger hole. If it was an asteroid, bigger hole. Nope, just this thing that looks exactly like what it'd look like if you whipped a rock into sand. Just kind of skips and, you know? This would happen. Buzz Lightyear to Star Command, we've crashed landed on a strange planet. I don't know, I'm not saying this stuff's covered up or anything, but like, I feel like if we have the equivalent of a bad garage door security camera, you know? Doing like a long 345 degree shots and only showing us more sand. This thing could be in the Gobi Desert for all we know. We'd never know the difference. Show us the bases, where's the monoliths? Also one lens, one lens? Like where's the x-ray, the infrared, radio waves? Let's go people. We've all played No Man's Sky. Where's the 4K and the jetpacks, dude? Number four, Paul Hellier. Okay, now on to some more scary stuff. Hey, also, if you dig the channel, make sure you like and subscribe or comment down below. Do you think they're releasing this late report to Congress or what? Just kind of hoping everyone forgets it's due and just moves on. Anyway. 
flying on up to Canada, who's been involved in UFOs for a very, very long time. The RAF and RCMP have been on top of this stuff. I'd say even before the Americans. Paul Theodore Hellier, August 1923 to August 2021. First off, rest in paradise sir. This man has done more for us up north than we'll ever know. This man has and will play a huge role in the UAP phenomenon as a whole. I encourage you all to look into Paul here a little bit deeper. An engineer, a politician, writer, commentator. He was the longest serving member of the Queen's Privy Council for Canada. In 1967, Hellyer inaugurated a UAP landing site in St. Paul, Alberta. The town built it as a Canadian centennial celebration project, as a symbol of keeping space free from human warfare. In 2005, Hellyer made headlines by publicly announcing that he was a true believer in the existence and was an invited speaker at the conference in Toronto where he shared that he had seen a UFO during his career. In 2007, Paul was demanding world governments to to disclose alien tech that could be used to solve problems of climate change. Hey, that's pretty cool. An interview in 2014, Hellier said that at least four species of aliens have been visiting Earth for the last thousand years, with most of them passing by from another star system, and of course, those living with us on Earth from Venus, Mars, and Saturn's moons. Awesome. Just for some credentials here, Paul ran for the federal election like 12 times. Yeah, Air Force, Navy, former Minister of National Defense. Guy was 98, people. Do some homework. He's easily the highest ranked true tinfoil haver we know of. 98 years that man graced our planet. I wonder what he knew. Number three, government. Speaking of disclosure and how we're all kind of right in the middle of it, right now, we go to Congress. It's odd because we obviously joke and have a good time and make light of the whole situation, but like, whether you like it or not, it's happening. First off, I'm scared. I'll admit it, I'm scared. I scared my stuff into this stuff. I discovered John Greenwald in like the ninth grade and it's been rabbit holes ever since. Let me tell you, when Congress starts talking about other planets and aliens, it starts mocking up some public citizen hearings with ex-Congress members. It's starting to get a little scary, but these public hearings, eh. They whip this bad boy out. The cream of the crop UFO video that they say they have. The portrait mode, the four seconds of a circular something. Like, that's it? Apparently it's taken from the cockpit of a US fighter jet. Huh. May 17th, 2022, members of the United States House Intelligence Subcommittee on Counterterrorism, Counterintelligence, and Counterproliferation held Congress hearings with top military officials to discuss the reports of UAPs. Did you miss it? Yeah, it was at 9 a.m. on a Tuesday. Yeah, really important stuff. Also, how come they put like the grainy 90s filter on the video? Dude, like we make videos here. We're not gonna notice that? This thing's grainier than the first episode of The Golden Girls. The first public Congress hearing in over 50 years, and this is it. Again, there's some mock citizen hearings that were way more convincing and way more informative from way more reliable personnel. Also, better quality. Interesting, huh? But again, why wasn't all this shared when it originally happened? The government says, yeah, there's like 14 things we can't explain, yet try and solve the easy ones. Apparently there's like 144 more classified videos to just rummage through. It's been a big month, I will say that. 16 candidates for the new UAP NASA program, report late from Halloween, weather balloons, airborne clutter, foreign surveillance. What are they gonna tell us this week? Number two, Dave Foley. And we come to yet another great Canadian, Mr. Dave Foley. Those of you who aren't familiar with the North and what we produce up here, Dave is a Canadian actor, comedian, director, producer, and writer. He created Kids in the Hall, a Canadian gem, and also an avid believer in the phenomenon. He took to Twitter a couple months ago and caught the attention of many. Foley tweeted, quote, after years of interest in the UFOs without ever seeing anything, I saw something. This is a drawing of what I saw. I was with a friend who I'll let decide if he wants to be attached to this. It moved silently, at great speed, hovered and pulsated with light, end quote. Now this ship does look a lot like what we've seen in the past reports. So who knows, Dave may actually have seen a UFO. Maybe these aliens are just fans of a bug's life. Guys flick, man. Maybe they just want an autograph, I know I would. He continues online, quote, many people who have encountered the phenomenon are afraid to discuss it because of the thoughtless and uninformed derision it inspires. Many who discuss it have had their lives ruined by that derision. I should point out, the white lights were on the front of the craft, assuming it was moving forward and those lights pulsated separately from the body of the craft, which also pulsated. We felt like our emotions were being tamped down. We were unnaturally unresponsive to what we were seeing. In a way, I'm still experiencing that." End quote. Hey, it's all fun and games when the celebs get involved, isn't it? But up here, Canada's been involved for a long time. 
more publicly too. Just last week, a report said that Canadians were briefed last year on what's what with the phenomenon. A document released a couple days ago say the February briefings were delivered by multiple members of the Pentagon UAP task force and attending was 10 Canadian defense officials, including the Royal Canadian Air Force and military intelligence, right? Like not just comedians and sketches, you know? These people have been around a while and read some stuff, Paul Hellier type stuff. And number one, Tom DeLong. Come on, this is an easy one. And probably the most confusing yet reliable source of them all? I know, trust me. Blink-182. Hey mom, there's something in the back room. Well, there actually could be. Remember enjoying their song Aliens Exist before believing that aliens actually exist? Yeah, the lyrics hit a bit different now, don't they? Cut to 2017, former Blink member Tom DeLonge, now the co-founder of To The Stars Academy of Arts and Science. Sounds fun, right? until you see the panel. Military generals, astrophysicists, psychologists that have been studying this stuff since the 50s. It's the real deal. But how can a rock star be the head of this phenomenon? Well, he's into aliens, and that's an understatement. Susan Gao, the Pentagon spokesperson who made the public statements on disclosure, said that the Navy had confirmed that those three videos that are so wide in circulation are authentic recordings made by naval aviators. And guess who got all those out to us? Quote, everyone still looks to the United States government as having all the resources. We've been waiting around as scholars and researchers for many decades, hoping God that one day the government would come to us on what this is. This whole thing could be answered by the government. We're just waiting for them to come help us out with some of the research. This situation that happened is what we've been hoping it would do. So it can ignite more intellectuals to get into this race and help us figure out more about it. End quote. I couldn't agree with you more, Tom. Physicists, astronauts, that's who we want to hear from, you know? And just for dessert, here's what Tom posted on his Instagram. You tell me what's up. <laughs>